Section 69 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 69. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Dick, at what time of life may a man think himself exempted from the necessity of sacrificing his repose to the punctilious of a contemptible world? I have been engaged in a ridiculous adventure, which I shall recount at meeting, and this, I hope, will not be much longer delayed, as we have now performed almost all our visits, and seen everything that I think has any right to retard us in our journey homewards. A few days ago, understanding by accident that my old friend Baynard was in the country, I would not pass so near his habitation without paying him a visit, though our correspondence had been interrupted for a long course of years. I felt myself very sensibly affected by the idea of our past intimacy as we approached the place where we had spent so many happy days together. But when we arrived at the house, I could not recognize any one of those objects which had been so deeply impressed upon my remembrance. The tall oaks that shaded the avenue had been cut down, and the iron gates at the end of it removed, together with the high wall that surrounded the courtyard. The house itself, which was formerly a convent of Cistercian monks, had a venerable appearance, and along the front that looked into the garden was a stone gallery which afforded me many an agreeable walk when I was disposed to be contemplative. Now the old front is covered with a screen of modern architecture, so that all without is Grecian, and all within Gothic. As for the garden, which was well stocked with the best fruit which England could produce, there is not now the least vestige remaining of trees, walls, or hedges. Nothing appears but a naked circus of loose sand, with a dry basin and a leaden triton in the middle. You must know that Baynard, at his father's death, had a clear estate of fifteen hundred pounds a year, and was in other respects extremely well qualified to make a respectable figure in the commonwealth. But, what with some excesses of youth and the expense of a contested election, he in a few years found himself encumbered with a debt of ten thousand pounds, which he resolved to discharge by means of a prudent marriage. He accordingly married a Miss Thompson, whose fortune amounted to double the sum that he owed. She was the daughter of a citizen who had failed in trade, but her fortune came by an uncle, who died in the East Indies. Her own parents being dead, she lived with a maiden aunt, who had superintended her education, and in all appearance was well enough qualified for the usual purposes of the married state. Her virtues, however, stood rather upon a negative than a positive foundation. She was neither proud, insolent, nor capricious, nor given to scandal, nor addicted to gaming, nor inclined to gallantry. She could read and write, and dance and sing, and play upon the harpsichord, and smatter French, and take a hand at whist and ombre, but even these accomplishments she possessed by halves. She excelled in nothing. Her conversation was flat, her style mean, and her expression embarrassed. In a word, her character was totally insipid. Her person was not disagreeable, but there was nothing graceful in her address, nor engaging in her manners and she was so ill-qualified to do the honours of the house, that when she sat at the head of the table one was always looking for the mistress of the family in some other place. Baynard had flattered himself that it would be no difficult matter to mould such a subject after his own fashion, and that she would cheerfully enter into his views, which were wholly turned to domestic happiness. He proposed to reside always in the country, of which he was fond to a degree of enthusiasm, to cultivate his estate, which was very improvable, to enjoy the exercise of rural diversions, to maintain an intimacy of correspondence with some friends that were settled in his neighbourhood, to keep a comfortable house without suffering his expense to exceed the limits of his income, and to find pleasure and employ merit for his wife in the management and avocations of her own family. This, however, was a visionary scheme, which he never was able to realise. His wife was as ignorant as a new-born babe of everything that related to the conduct of a family and she had no idea of a country life. Her understanding did not reach so far as to comprehend the first principles of discretion, and, indeed, if her capacity had been better than it was, her natural indolence would not have permitted her to abandon a certain routine to which she had been habituated. She had not taste enough to relish any rational enjoyment, but her ruling passion was vanity, 
not that species which arises from self-conceit of superior accomplishments, but that which is of a bastard and idiot nature, excited by shoe and ostentation, which implies not even the least consciousness of any personal merit. The nuptial peal of noise and nonsense being rung out in all the usual changes, Mr. Brainerd thought it high time to make her acquainted with the particulars of the plan which he had projected. He told her that his fortune, though sufficient to afford all the comforts of life, was not ample enough to command all the superfluities of pomp and pageantry, which indeed were equally absurd and intolerable. He therefore hoped she would have no objection to their leaving London in the spring, when he would take the opportunity to dismiss some unnecessary domestics whom he had hired for the occasion of their marriage. She heard him in silence, and after some pause, "'So,' said she, "'I am to be buried in the country.' He was so confounded at this reply that he could not speak for some minutes. At length he told her he was much mortified to find he had proposed anything that was disagreeable to her ideas. "'I am sure,' added he, "'I meant nothing more than to lay down a comfortable plan of living within the bounds of our fortune, which is but moderate.' "'Sir,' said she, "'you are the best judge of your own affairs. My fortune, I know, does not exceed twenty thousand pounds.' Yet, even with that pittance, I might have had a husband who would not have begrudged me a house in London. "'Good God, my dear!' cried poor Baynard, in the utmost agitation. "'You don't think me so sordid. I only hinted what I thought, but I don't pretend to impose.' "'Yes, sir,' resumed the lady. "'It is your prerogative to command, and my duty to obey.' So saying, she burst into tears, and retired to her chamber, where she was joined by her aunt. He endeavoured to recollect himself, and act with vigour of mind on this occasion, but was betrayed by the tenderness of his nature, which was the greatest defect of his constitution. He found the aunt in tears, and the niece in a fit, which held her the best part of eight hours, at the expiration of which she began to talk incoherently about death and her dear husband, who had sat by her all this time, and now pressed her hand to his lips in a transport of grief and penitence for the offence she had given. From thence forward he carefully avoided mentioning the country, and they continued to be sucked deeper and deeper into the vortex of extravagance and dissipation, leading what is called a fashionable life in town. About the latter end of July, however, Mrs. Baynard, in order to exhibit a proof of conjugal obedience, desired of her own accord that they might pay a visit to his country house, as there was no company left in London. He would have excused himself from this excursion, which was no part of the economical plan he had proposed, but she insisted upon making this sacrifice to his taste and prejudices, and away they went with such an equipage as astonished the whole country. All that remained of the season was engrossed by receiving and returning visits in the neighbourhood, and in this intercourse it was discovered that Sir John Chickwell had a house-steward and one footman in livery more than the complement of Mr. Baynard's household. This remark was made by the aunt at table, and assented to by the husband, who observed that Sir John Chickwell might very well afford to keep more servants than were found in the family of a man who had not half his fortune. Mrs. Baynard ate no supper that evening, but was seized with a violent fit, which completed her triumph over the spirit of her consort. The two supernumerary servants were added, the family plate was sold for old silver, and a new service procured fashionable furniture was provided, and the whole house turned topsy-turvy. At their return to London in the beginning of winter, he, with a heavy heart, communicated these particulars to me in confidence. Before his marriage he had introduced me to the lady as his particular friend, and I now offered in that character to lay before her the necessity of reforming her economy, if she had any regard to the interest of her own family or complacence for the inclinations of her husband. But Baynard declined my offer on the supposition that his wife's nerves were too delicate to bear expostulation, and that it would only serve to overwhelm her with such distress as would make himself miserable. Baynard is a man of spirit, and had she proved a termagant, he would have known how to deal with her. But either by accident or instinct, she fastened upon the weak side of his soul, and held it so fast that he has been in subjection ever since. I afterwards advised him to carry her abroad to France or Italy, where he might gratify her vanity for half the expense it cost him in England, and this advice he followed accordingly. She was agreeably flattered with the idea of seeing and knowing foreign parts and foreign fashions, of being presented to sovereigns and living familiarly with princes. 
she forthwith seized the hint which i had thrown out on purpose and even pressed mr baynard to hasten his departure so that in a few weeks they crossed the sea to france with a moderate train still including the aunt who was her bosom counsellor and abetted her in all her oppositions to her husband's will since that period i have had little or no opportunity to renew our former correspondence all that i knew of his transactions amounted to no more than that after an absence of two years they returned so little improved in economy that they launched out into new oceans of extravagance which at length obliged him to mortgage his estate by this time she had bore him three children of which the last only survives a puny boy of twelve or thirteen who will be ruined in his education by the indulgence of his mother as for baynard neither his own good sense nor the dread of indigence nor the consideration of his children has been a force sufficient to stimulate him into the resolution of breaking at once the shameful spell by which he seems enchanted with a taste capable of the most refined enjoyment a heart glowing with all the warmth of friendship and humanity and a disposition strongly turned to the more rational pleasures of a retired and country life he is hurried about in a perpetual tumult amidst a mob of beings pleased with rattles baubles and gewgaws so void of sense and distinction that even the most acute philosopher would find it a very hard task to discover for what wise purpose of providence they were created friendship is not to be found nor can the amusements for which he sighs be enjoyed within the rotation of absurdity to which he is doomed for life he has long resigned all views of improving his fortune by management and attention to the exercise of husbandry in which he delighted and as to domestic happiness not the least glimpse of hope remains to amuse his imagination thus blasted in all his prospects he could not fail to be overwhelmed with melancholy and chagrin which have preyed upon his health and spirits in such a manner that he is now threatened with the consumption i have given you a sketch of the man whom the other day i went to visit at the gate we found a great number of powdered lackeys but no civility after we had sat a considerable time in the coach we were told that mr baynard had rode out and that his lady was dressing but we were introduced to a parlour so very fine and delicate that in all appearance it was designed to be seen only not inhabited the chairs and couches were carved gilt and covered with rich damask so smooth and slick that they looked as if they had never been sat upon there was no carpet upon the floor but the boards were rubbed and waxed in such a manner that we could not walk but were obliged to slide along them and as for the stove it was too bright and polished to be polluted with sea-coal or stained by the smoke of any gross material fire when we had remained above half an hour sacrificing to the inhospitable powers in the temple of cold reception my friend baynard arrived and understanding we were in the house made his appearance so meagre yellow and dejected that i really should not have known him had i met with him in any other place running up to me with great eagerness he strained me in his embrace and his heart was so full that for some minutes he could not speak having saluted us all round he perceived our uncomfortable situation and conducting us into another apartment which had fire in the chimney called for chocolate then withdrawing he returned with a compliment from his wife and in the meantime presented his son harry a shambling blear-eyed boy in the habit of a hussar very rude forward and impertinent his father would have sent him to a boarding-school but his mamma and aunt would not hear of his lying out of the house so that there was a clergyman engaged as his tutor in the family as it was but just turned of twelve and the whole house was in commotion to prepare a formal entertainment I foresaw it would be late before we dined, and proposed a walk to Mr. Baynard, that we might converse together freely. In the course of this perambulation, when I expressed some surprise that he had returned so soon from Italy, he gave me to understand that his going abroad had not at all answered the purpose for which he left England, that although the expense of living was not so great in Italy as at home, respect being had to the same rank of life in both countries, it had been found necessary for him to lift himself above his usual style that he might be on some footing with the counts marquises and cavaliers with whom he kept company he was obliged to hire a great number of servants to take off a great variety of rich clothes and to keep a sumptuous table for the fashionable scorsoni of the country who without a consideration of this kind would not have paid any attention to an untitled foreigner 
let his family or fortune be ever so respectable. Besides, Mrs. Baynard was continually surrounded by a train of expensive loungers under the denominations of language masters, musicians, painters, and ciceroni, and had actually fallen into the disease of buying pictures and antiques upon her own judgment, which was far from being infallible. At length she met with an affront which gave her disgust to Italy, and drove her back to England with some precipitation. By means of frequenting the Duchess of Bedford's conversation while her grace was at Rome, Mrs. Baynard became acquainted with all the fashionable people of that city, and was admitted to their assemblies without scruple. Thus favoured, she conceived too great an idea of her own importance, and when the Duchess left Rome, resolved to have a conversation that should leave the Romans no room to regret her grace's departure. She provided hands for a musical entertainment, and sent Biglietti of invitation to every person of distinction, but not one Roman of the female sex appeared at her assembly. She was that night seized with a violent fit, and kept her bed three days, at the expiration of which she declared that the air of Italy would be the ruin of her constitution. In order to prevent this catastrophe, she was speedily removed to Geneva, from whence they returned to England, by the way of Lyons and Paris. By the time they arrived at Calais, she had purchased such a quantity of silks, stuffs, and laces, that it was necessary to hire a vessel to smuggle them over, and this vessel was taken by a custom-house cutter, so that they lost the whole cargo which had cost them above eight hundred pounds. It now appears that her travels had produced no effect upon her, but that of making her more expensive and fantastic than ever. She affected to lead the fashion, not only in point of female dress, but in every article of taste and connoisseurship. She made a drawing of the new façade to the house in the country. She pulled up the trees, and pulled down the walls of the garden, so as to let in the easterly wind which Mr. Baynard's ancestors had been at great pains to exclude. To shew her taste in laying out ground, she seized into her own hand a farm of two hundred acres, about a mile from the house, which she parcelled out into walks and shrubberies, having a great basin in the middle, into which she poured a whole stream that turned two mills, and afforded the best trout in the country. The bottom of the basin, however, was so ill-secured that it would not hold the water which strained through the earth, and made a bog of the whole plantation. In a word, the ground, which formerly paid him one hundred and fifty pounds a year, now cost him two hundred pounds a year to keep it in tolerable order, over and above the first expense of trees, shrubs, flowers, turf, and gravel. There was not an inch of garden ground left about the house, nor a tree that produced fruit of any kind. Nor did he raise a truss of hay or a bushel of oats for his horses, nor had he a single cow to afford milk for his tea. Far less did he ever dream of feeding his own mutton, pigs, and poultry. Every article of housekeeping, even the most inconsiderable, was brought from the next market-town at the distance of five miles, and thither they sent a courier every morning to fetch hot rolls for breakfast. In short, Baynard fairly owned that he spent double his income, and that in a few years he should be obliged to sell his estate for the payment of his creditors. He said that his wife had such delicate nerves and such imbecility of spirit, that she could neither bear remonstrance, be it ever so gentle, nor practice any scheme of retrenchment, even if she perceived the necessity of such a measure. He had, therefore, ceased struggling against the stream, and endeavoured to reconcile himself to ruin, by reflecting that his child at least would inherit his mother's fortune, which was secured to him by the contract of marriage. The detail which he gave me of his affairs filled me at once with grief and indignation. I inveighed bitterly against the indiscretion of his wife, and reproached him with his unmanly acquiescence under the absurd tyranny which she exerted. I exhorted him to recollect his resolution, and make one effectual effort to disengage himself from a thraldom equally shameful and pernicious. I offered him all the assistance in my power. I undertook to regulate his affairs, and even to bring about a reformation in his family, if he would only authorize me to execute the plan I should form for his advantage. I was so affected by the subject that I could not help mingling tears with my remonstrances, and Baynard was so penetrated with these marks of my affection that he lost all power of utterance. He pressed me to his breast with great emotion, and wept in silence. At length he exclaimed, Friendship is undoubtedly the most precious balm of life. Your words, dear Bramble, have in a great measure recalled me from an abyss of despondence in which I have been long overwhelmed. 
I will, upon honour, make you acquainted with a distinct state of my affairs, and, as far as I am able to go, will follow the course you prescribe. But there are certain lengths which my nature— the truth is, there are tender connections of which a bachelor has no idea— shall I own my weakness? I cannot bear the thoughts of making that woman uneasy. And yet, cried I, she has seen you unhappy for a series of years, unhappy from her misconduct, without ever shewing the least inclination to alleviate your distress. Nevertheless, said he, I am persuaded she loves me with the most warm affection, but these are incongruities in the composition of the human mind, which I hold to be inexplicable. I was shocked at his infatuation, and changed the subject, after we had agreed to maintain a close correspondence for the future. He then gave me to understand that he had two neighbours, who, like himself, were driven by their wives at full speed in the high road to bankruptcy and ruin. All the three husbands were of dispositions very different from each other, and according to this variation their consorts were admirably suited to the purpose of keeping them all three in subjection. The views of the ladies were exactly the same. They vied in grandeur, that is, in ostentation, with the wife of Sir Charles Chickwell, who had four times their fortune, and she again piqued herself upon making an equal figure with a neighbouring peeress whose revenue trebled her own. Here, then, was the fable of the frog and the ox, realised in four different instances within the same county. One large fortune and three moderate estates, in a fair way of being burst by the inflation of female vanity, and in three of these instances three different forms of female tyranny were exercised. Mr. Baynard was subjugated by practising upon the tenderness of his nature. Mr. Milkson, being of a timorous disposition, truckled to the insolence of a termagant. Mr. Sowerby, who was of a temper neither to be moved by fits nor driven by menaces, had the fortune to be fitted with a helpmate who assailed him with the weapons of irony and satire, sometimes sneering in the way of compliment, sometimes throwing out sarcastic comparisons, implying reproaches upon his want of taste, spirit, and generosity, by which means she stimulated his passions from one act of extravagance to another, just as the circumstances of her vanity required. All these three ladies have, at this time, the same number of horses, carriages, and servants, in and out of livery, the same variety of dress, the same quantity of plate and china, the like ornaments and furniture, and in their entertainments they endeavour to exceed one another in the variety, delicacy, and expense of their dishes. I believe it will be found upon inquiry that nineteen out of twenty who are ruined by extravagance fall a sacrifice to the ridiculous pride and vanity of silly women, whose parts are held in contempt by the very men whom they pillage and enslave. Thank heaven, Dick, that among all the follies and weaknesses of human nature I have not yet fallen into that of matrimony. After Baynard and I had discussed all these matters at leisure, we returned towards the house, and met Jerry with our two women, who had come forth to take the air, as the lady of the mansion had not yet made her appearance. In short, Mrs. Baynard did not produce herself till about a quarter of an hour before dinner was upon the table. Then her husband brought her into the parlour, accompanied by her aunt and son, and she received us with a coldness of reserve sufficient to freeze the very soul of hospitality. Though she knew I had been the intimate friend of her husband, and had often seen me with him in London, she shewed no marks of recognition or regard when I addressed myself to her in the most friendly terms of salutation. She did not even express the common compliment of, I am glad to see you, or I hope you have enjoyed your health since we had the pleasure of seeing you, or some such words, of course. Nor did she once open her mouth in the way of welcome to my sister and my niece, but sat in silence like a statue, with an aspect of insensibility. Her aunt, the model upon which she had been formed, was indeed the very essence of insipid formality, but the boy was very pert and impudent, and prated without ceasing. At dinner the lady maintained the same ungracious indifference, never speaking but in whispers to her aunt, and as to the repast, it was made up of a parcel of kickshaws contrived by a French cook, without one substantial article adapted to the satisfaction of an English appetite. The pottage was little better than bread soaked in dishwashings, lukewarm. The ragouts looked as if they had been once eaten and half digested. The fricassees were involved in a nasty yellow poultice, and the rotis were scorched and stinking for the honour of the fumet. 
The dessert consisted of faded fruit and iced froth, a good emblem of our landlady's character. The table beer was sour, the water foul, and the wine vapid. But there was a parade of plate and china, and a powdered lackey stood behind every chair, except those of the master and mistress of the house, who were served by two valets dressed like gentlemen. We dined in a large old Gothic parlour, which was formerly the hall. It was now paved with marble, and notwithstanding the fire which had been kindled about an hour, struck me with such a chill sensation that when I entered it the teeth chattered in my jaws. In short, everything was cold, comfortless, and disgusting, except the looks of my friend Baynard, which declared the warmth of his affection and humanity. After dinner we withdrew into another apartment, where the boy began to be impertinently troublesome to my niece Liddy. He wanted a playfellow, forsooth, and would have romped with her had she encouraged his advances. He was even so impudent as to snatch a kiss, at which she changed countenance and seemed uneasy, and though his father checked him for the rudeness of his behaviour, he became so outrageous as to thrust his hand in her bosom, an insult to which she did not tamely submit, though one of the mildest creatures upon earth. Her eyes sparkling with resentment, she started up and lent him such a box in the ear as sent him staggering to the other side of the room. "'Miss Melford,' cried his father, "'you have treated him with the utmost propriety. I am only sorry that the impertinence of any child of mine should have occasioned this exertion of your spirit, which I cannot but applaud and admire.' His wife was so far from assenting to the candour of his apology, that she rose from the table, and taking her son by the hand, "'Come, child,' said she, "'your father cannot abide you.' So saying, she retired with this hopeful youth, and was followed by her gouvernante but neither the one nor the other deigned to take the least notice of the company. Baynard was exceedingly disconcerted, but I perceived his uneasiness was tinctured with resentment, and derived a good omen from this discovery. I ordered the horses to be put to the carriage, and though he made some efforts to detain us all night, I insisted upon leaving the house immediately. But before I went away I took an opportunity of speaking to him again in private. I said everything I could recollect to animate his endeavours in shaking off those shameful trammels. I made no scruple to declare that his wife was unworthy of that tender complacence which he had shewn for her foibles, that she was dead to all the genuine sentiments of conjugal affection, insensible of her own honour and interest, and seemingly destitute of common sense and reflection. I conjured him to remember what he owed to his father's house, to his own reputation, and to his family including even this unreasonable woman herself, who was driving on blindly to her own destruction. I advised him to form a plan for retrenching superfluous expense, and try to convince the aunt of the necessity for such a reformation, that she might gradually prepare her niece for its execution. And I exhorted him to turn that disagreeable piece of formality out of the house, if he should find her averse to his proposal. Here he interrupted me with a sigh, observing that such a step would undoubtedly be fatal to Mrs. Baynard. "'I shall lose all patience,' cried I, "'to hear you talk so weakly. Mrs. Baynard's fits will never hurt her constitution. I believe in my conscience they are all affected. I am sure she has no feeling for your distresses, and when you are ruined she will appear to have no feeling for her own.' Finally I took his word and honour that he would make an effort, such as I had advised, that he would form a plan of economy, and if he found it impracticable, without my assistance, he would come to Bath in the winter, where I promised to give him the meeting, and contribute all in my power to the retrieval of his affairs. With this mutual engagement we parted, and I shall think myself supremely happy if, by my means, a worthy man whom I love and esteem can be saved from misery, disgrace, and despair. I have only one friend more to visit in this part of the country, but he is of a complexion very different from that of Baynard. You have heard me mention Sir Thomas Bulford, whom I knew in Italy. He has now become a country gentleman, but being disabled by the gout from enjoying any amusement abroad, he entertains himself within doors by keeping open house for all comers, and playing upon the oddities and humours of his company. But he himself is generally the greatest original at his table. He is very good-humoured, talks much, and laughs without ceasing. I am told that all the use he makes of his understanding at present is to excite mirth by exhibiting his guests in ludicrous attitudes. I know not how far we may furnish him with entertainment of this kind, but
that I am resolved to beat up his quarters, partly with a view to laugh with the knight himself, and partly to pay my respects to his lady, a good-natured, sensible woman, with whom he lives upon very easy terms, although she has not had the good fortune to bring him an heir to his estate. And now, dear Dick, I must tell you, for your comfort, that you are the only man upon earth to whom I would presume to send such a long-winded epistle, which I could not find in my heart to curtail, because the subject interested the warmest passions of my heart. Neither will I make any other apology to a correspondent who has been so long accustomed to the impertinence of Matt Bramble, September 30. End of section 69「Section seventy of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section seventy. To Sir Watkin Phillips, Baronet, at Oxford. Dear Knight, I believe there is something mischievous in my disposition, for nothing diverts me so much as to see certain characters tormented with false terrors. We last night lodged at the house of Sir Thomas Bulford, an old friend of my uncle, a jolly fellow of moderate intellects, who in spite of the gout which hath lamed him is resolved to be merry to the last and mirth he has a particular knack in extracting from his guests let their humour be ever so caustic or refractory besides our company there was in the house a fat-headed justice of the peace called frogmore and a country practitioner in surgery who seemed to be our landlord's chief companion and confidant. We found the knight sitting on a couch, with his crutches by his side, and his feet supported on cushions. But he received us with a hearty welcome, and seems greatly rejoiced at our arrival. After tea we were entertained with a sonata on the harpsichord by Lady Bulford, who sung and played to admiration but sir thomas seemed to be a little asinine in the article of ears though he affected to be in raptures and begged his wife to favour us with an arietta of her own composing this arietta however she no sooner began to perform than he and the justice fell asleep but the moment she ceased playing the knight waked snorting and exclaimed o oh, cara what do you think gentlemen will you talk any more of your parga lazy and your corelli at the same time he thrust his tongue in one cheek and leered with one eye at the doctor and me who sat on his left hand he concluded the pantomime with a loud laugh which he could command at all times extempore. Notwithstanding his disorder, he did not do penance at supper, nor did he ever refuse his glass when the toast went round, but rather encouraged a quick circulation, both by precept and example. I soon perceived the doctor had made himself very necessary to the baronet, he was the whetstone of his wit, the butt of his satire, and his operator in certain experiments of humour which were occasionally tried upon strangers. Justice Frogmore was an excellent subject for this species of philosophy. Sleek and corpulent, solemn and shallow, he had studied burn with uncommon application but he studied nothing so much as the art of living, that is, eating well. This fat buck had often afforded good sport to our landlord, 
and he was frequently started with tolerable success in the course of this evening but the baronet's appetite for ridicule seemed to be chiefly excited by the appearance address and conversation of lismahago whom he attempted in all different modes of exposition but he put me in mind of a contest that i once saw betwixt a young hound and an old hedgehog the dog turned him over and over and bounced and barked and mumbled but as often as he attempted to bite he felt a prickle in his jaws and recoiled in manifest confusion the captain when left to himself will not fail to turn his ludicrous side to the company but if any man attempts to force him into that attitude he becomes stubborn as a mule and unmanageable as an elephant unbroke divers tolerable jokes were cracked upon the justice who ate a most unconscionable supper and among other things a large plate of broiled mushrooms which he had no sooner swallowed than the doctor observed with great gravity that they were of the kind called champignons which in some constitutions has a poisonous effect mr frogmore startled at this remark asked in some confusion why he had not been so kind as to give him that notice sooner he answered that he took it for granted by his eating them so heartily that he was used to the dish but as he seemed to be under some apprehension he prescribed a bumper of plague-water which the justice drank off immediately and retired to rest not without marks of terror and disquiet at midnight we were shown to our different chambers and in half an hour i was fast asleep in bed but about three o'clock in the morning i was waked with a dismal cry of fire and starting up ran to the window in my shirt the night was dark and stormy and a number of people half dressed ran backwards and forwards through the courtyard with links and lanterns seemingly in the utmost hurry and trepidation slipping on my clothes in a twinkling i ran downstairs and upon inquiry found the fire was confined to a back stair which led to a detached apartment where lismahago lay by this time the lieutenant was alarmed by bawling at his window which was in the second story but he could not find his clothes in the dark and his room door was locked on the outside the servants called to him that the house had been robbed that without all doubt the villains had taken away his clothes fastened the door and set the house on fire for the staircase was in flames in this dilemma the poor lieutenant ran about the room naked like a squirrel in a cage popping out his head at the window between whiles and imploring assistance at length the knight in person was brought out in his chair attended by my uncle and all the family including our aunt tabitha who screamed and cried and tore her hair as if she had been distracted sir thomas had already ordered his people to bring a long ladder which was applied to the captain's window and now he exhorted him earnestly to descend there was no need of much rhetoric to persuade lismahago who forthwith made his exit by the window roaring all the time to the people below to hold fast the ladder notwithstanding the gravity of the occasion it was impossible to behold this scene without being seized with an inclination to laugh the rueful aspect of the lieutenant in his shirt with a quilted nightcap fastened under his chin and his long lank limbs and posteriors exposed to the wind made a very picturesque appearance when illumined by the links and torches which the servants held up to light him in his descent 
all the company stood round the ladder except the knight who sat in his chair exclaiming from time to time lord have mercy upon us save the gentleman's life mind your footing dear captain softly stand fast clasp the ladder with both hands there well done my dear boy oh bravo an old soldier for ever bring a blanket bring a warm blanket to comfort his poor carcass warm the bed in the green room give me your hand dear captain i am rejoiced to see thee safe and sound with all my heart lismahago was received at the bottom of the ladder by his inamorata who snatching a blanket from one of the maids wrapped it about his body two men-servants took him under the arms and a female conducted him to the green room still accompanied by mistress tabitha who saw him fairly put to bed during this whole transaction he spoke not a syllable but looked exceeding grim sometimes at one sometimes at another of the spectators who now adjourned in a body to the parlour where we had supped every one surveying another with marks of astonishment and curiosity the knight being seated in an easy chair seized my uncle by the hand and bursting into a long and loud laugh matt cried he crown me with oak or ivy or laurel or parsley or what you will and acknowledge this to be a coup de maitre in the way of waggery ha 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 such a camisciata scagliata beffata oh che roba oh what a subject oh what caricatura oh for a rosa a rembrandt a schalken zooks i'd give a hundred guineas to have it painted what a fine descent from the cross or ascent to the gallows what light and shadows what a group below what expression above what an aspect did you mind the aspect ha 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 and the limbs and the muscles every toe denoted terror ha 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 then the blanket oh what costume st andrew st lazarus st barabbas ha 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 after all then cried mr bramble very gravely this was no more than a false alarm we have been frightened out of our beds and almost out of our senses for the joke's sake ay and such a joke cried our landlord such a farce such a denouement such a catastrophe have a little patience replied our squire we are not yet come to the catastrophe and pray god it may not turn out a tragedy instead of a farce the captain is one of those saturnine subjects who have no idea of humour he never laughs in his own person nor can he bear that other people should laugh at his expense besides if the subject had been properly chosen the joke was too severe in all conscience Steth! cried the knight i could not have baited him an ace had he been my own father and as for the subject such another does not present itself once in half a century here mistress tabitha interposing and bridling up declared she did not see that mr lismahago was a fitter subject for ridicule than the knight himself and that she was very much afraid he would very soon find that he had mistaken his man the baronet was a good deal disconcerted by this intimation saying that he must be a goth and a barbarian if he did not enter into the spirit of such a happy and humorous contrivance he begged however that mr bramble and his sister would bring him to reason and this request was reinforced by lady bulford who did not fail to read the baronet a lecture upon his indiscretion which lecture he received with submission on one side of his face and a leer upon the other we now went to bed for the second time 
and before i got up my uncle had visited lismahago in the green-room and used such arguments with him that when we met in the parlour he seemed to be quite appeased he received the knight's apology with good grace and even professed himself pleased at finding he had contributed to the diversion of the company sir thomas shook him by the hand laughing heartily and then desired a pinch of snuff in token of perfect reconciliation the lieutenant putting his hand in his waistcoat pocket pulled out instead of his own scotch mull a very fine gold snuff-box which he no sooner perceived than he said here is a small mistake no mistake at all cried the baronet a fair exchange is no robbery oblige me so far captain as to let me keep your mull as a memorial sir said the lieutenant the mull is much at your service but this machine i can by no means retain it looks like compounding a sort of felony in the code of honour besides i don't know but there may be another joke in this conveyance and i don't find myself disposed to be brought upon the stage again i won't presume i won't presume to make free with your pockets but i beg you will put it up again with your own hand so saying with a certain austerity of aspect he presented the snuff-box to the knight who received it in some confusion and restored the mull which he would by no means keep except on the terms of exchange this transaction was like to give a grave cast to the conversation when my uncle took notice that mr justice frogmore had not made his appearance either at the night alarm or now at the general rendezvous the baronet hearing frogmore mentioned odd so cried he i had forgot the justice prithee doctor go and bring him out of his kennel then laughing till his sides were well shaken he said he would show the captain that he was not the only person of the drama exhibited for the entertainment of the company as to the night scene it could not affect the justice who had been purposely lodged in the farther end of the house remote from the noise and lulled with a dose of opium into the bargain in a few minutes mr justice was led into the parlour in his nightcap and loose morning-gown rolling his head from side to side and groaning piteously all the way jesu neighbour frogmore exclaimed the baronet what is the matter you look as if you was not a man for this world set him down softly on the couch poor gentleman lord have mercy upon us what makes him so pale and yellow and bloated oh sir thomas cried the justice i doubt it is all over with me those mushrooms i ate at your table have done my business ah oh ah now the lord forbid said the other what man have a good heart how does thy stomach feel hey to this interrogation he made no reply but throwing aside his nightgown discovered that his waistcoat would not meet upon his belly by five good inches at least heaven protect us all cried sir thomas what a melancholy spectacle never did i see a man so suddenly swelled but when he was either just dead or just dying doctor canst thou do nothing for this poor object i don't think the case is quite desperate said the surgeon but i would advise mr frogmore to settle his affairs with all expedition the parson may come and pray by him while i prepare a glister and an emetic draught the justice rolling his languid eyes ejaculated with great fervency lord have mercy upon us christ have mercy upon us then he begged the surgeon in the name of god to dispatch 
as for my worldly affairs said he they are all settled but one mortgage which must be left to my heirs but my poor soul my poor soul what will become of my poor soul miserable sinner that i am nay hey, prithee my dear boy compose thyself resumed the knight consider the mercy of heaven is infinite thou canst not have any sins of a very deep dye on thy conscience or the devil's in it name not the devil exclaimed the terrified frogmore i have more sins to answer for than the world dreams of ah oh, friend i have been sly sly damned sly send for the parson without loss of time and put me to bed for i am posting to eternity he was accordingly raised from the couch and supported by two servants who led him back to his room but before he quitted the parlour he entreated the good company to assist him with their prayers he added take warning by me who am suddenly cut off in my prime like a flower of the field and god forgive you sir thomas for suffering such poisonous trash to be eaten at your table he was no sooner removed out of hearing than the baronet abandoned himself to a violent fit of laughing in which he was joined by the greatest part of the company but we could hardly prevent the good lady from going to undeceive the patient by discovering that while he slept his waistcoat had been straightened by the contrivance of the surgeon and that the disorder in his stomach and bowels was occasioned by some antimonial wine which he had taken overnight under the denomination of plague water she seemed to think that his apprehension might put an end to his life the knight swore he was no such chicken but a tough old rogue that would live long enough to plague all his neighbours upon inquiry we found his character did not entitle him to much compassion or respect and therefore we let our landlord's humour take its course a glister was actually administered by an old woman of the family who had been sir thomas's nurse and the patient took a draught made with oxymel of squills to forward the operation of the antimonial wine which had been retarded by the opiate of the preceding night he was visited by the vicar who read prayers and began to take an account of the state of his soul when those medicines produced their effect so that the parson was obliged to hold his nose while he poured forth spiritual consolation from his mouth the same expedient was used by the knight and me who with the doctor entered the chamber at this juncture and found frogmore enthroned on an easing chair under the pressure of a double evacuation the short intervals betwixt every heave he employed in crying for mercy confessing his sins or asking the vicar's opinion of his case and the vicar answered in a solemn snuffling tone that heightened the ridicule of the scene the emetic having done its office the doctor interfered and ordered the patient to be put in bed again when he examined the egesta and felt his pulse he declared that much of the virus was discharged and giving him a composing draught assured him he had good hopes of his recovery this welcome hint he received with the tears of joy in his eyes protesting that if he should recover he would always think himself indebted for his life to the great skill and tenderness of his doctor whose hand he squeezed with great fervour and thus he was left to his repose we were pressed to stay dinner that we might be witnesses of his resuscitation but my uncle insisted upon our departing before noon that we might reach this town before it should be dark 
in the meantime lady bulford conducted us into the garden to see a fish-pond just finished which mr bramble censured as being too near the parlour where the knight now sat by himself dozing in an elbow-chair after the fatigues of his morning achievement in this situation he reclined with his feet wrapped in flannel and supported in a line with his body when the door flying open with a violent shock lieutenant lismahago rushed into the room with horror in his looks exclaiming a mad dog a mad dog and throwing up the window sash leapt into the garden sir thomas waked by this tremendous exclamation started up and forgetting his gout followed the lieutenant's example by a kind of instinctive impulse he not only bolted through the window like an arrow from a bow but ran up to his middle in the pond before he gave the least sign of recollection then the captain began to bawl lord have mercy upon us pray take care of the gentleman for god's sake mind your footing my dear boy get warm blankets comfort his poor carcass warm the bed in the green room lady bulford was thunderstruck at this phenomenon and the rest of the company gazed in silent astonishment while the servants hastened to assist their master who suffered himself to be carried back into the parlour without speaking a word being instantly accommodated with dry clothes and flannels comforted with a cordial and replaced in statu quo one of the maids was ordered to chafe his lower extremities an operation in consequence of which his senses seemed to return and his good humour to revive as we had followed him into the room he looked at every individual in his turn with a certain ludicrous expression in his countenance but fixed his eyes in particular upon lismahago who presented him with a pinch of snuff and when he took it in silence sir thomas bulford said he i am much obliged to you for all your favours and some of them i have endeavoured to repay in your ain coin give me thy hand cried the baronet thou hast indeed paid me scot and lot and even left a balance in my hands for which in presence of this company i promise to be accountable so saying he laughed very heartily and even seemed to enjoy the retaliation which had been exacted at his own expense but lady bulford looked very grave and in all probability thought the lieutenant had carried his resentment too far considering that her husband was valetudinary but according to the proverb he that will play at bowls must expect to meet with rubbers i have seen a tame bear very diverting when properly managed become a very dangerous wild beast when teased for the entertainment of the spectators as for lismahago he seemed to think the fright and the cold bath would have a good effect upon his patient's constitution but the doctor hinted some apprehension that the gouty matter might by such a sudden shock be repelled from the extremities and thrown upon some of the more vital parts of the machine i should be very sorry to see this prognostic verified upon our facetious landlord who told mistress tabitha at parting that he hoped she would remember him in the distribution of the bride's favours as he had taken so much pains to put the captain's parts and metal to the proof after all i am afraid our squire will appear to be the greatest sufferer by the baronet's wit for his constitution is by no means calculated for night alarms he has yawned and shivered all day and gone to bed without supper so that as we have got into good quarters 
i imagine we shall make a halt to-morrow in which case you will have at least one day's respite from the persecution of j melford october the third end of section seventy Section 71 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 71. To Mrs. Mary Jones at Brambleton Hall. Dear Mary Jones, Miss Liddy is so good as to unclose me in a kiver as far as Gloucester, and the carrier will bring it to hand. God send us all safe to Monmouthshire, for I'm quite jaded with rambling. Tis a true saying, live and learn. O oh, woman, what chuckling and changing have I seen! Well, there's nothing certain in this world. Who would have thought that mistress, after all the pains taken for the good of her precious soul, would go for to throw away her poor body? that she would cast the haze of infection upon such a carrying crow as Lash Mahago, as old as Methuselah, as dry as a red herring, and as poor as a starved weasel. O oh, Molly, hadst thou seen him come down the ladder, in a shirt so scanty that it could not kiver his nakedness? The young squire called him Dunquickset, but he looked for all the world like Craddock at Morgan, the old tinker, that suffered at a burgundy for stealing of kettle. Then he's a profane scuffle, and, as Mr. Clinker says, no better than an infidel, continually playing upon the pie-bill and the new birth. I doubt he has as little manners as money, for he can't say a civil word, much more make me a present of a pair of gloves for good will. But he looks as if he wanted to be very forward and familiar. Oh, that ever a gentlewoman of years and discretion should tear her air, and cry and disporage herself for such a nubjack. As the song goes, I vow she would fain love a bird that bid such a price for an owl. But for Sartin, he must have dealt with some Scotch musician to bring her to this pass. As for me, I put my trust in the Lord, and I have got a slice of witch elm sewed in the gathers of my under petticoat, and Mr. Clinker assures me that by the new light of Greece, I may deify the devil and his works. But I knows what I knows. If mistress should take up with Lashmihago, this is no sarvice for me. Thank God there's no want of places, and if it wa'n't for one thing, I would. But no matter Madame Baynard's woman has twenty good pounds a year and parquisites, and dresses like a parson of distinction. I dined with her and the Valley de Shambles with bags and golden jackets, but there was nothing comfitable to eat, being as how they lived upon board, and having nothing but a piss of cold cuddling tart and some blagmangy. I was tucked with the cullock, and a mercy it was that mistress had her vial of acings in the cocks. But as I was saying, I think for sartain this match will go forward, for things are come to a crisis, and I have seen with my own bays much smuggling but I scorn for to exclose the secrets of the family, and if it once comes to marrying, who knows but the frolic may go round. I believes as how Miss Liddy would have no reversion if her swan would appear, and you would be surprised, Molly, to receive a bride's fever from your humble servant. But this is all suppository, dear girl, and I have sullenly promised Mr. Clinker that neither man, woman, nor child shall know that arrow said a civil thing to me in the way of infection. I hope to drink your health at Brambleton Hall, in a horn of October, before the month be out. Pray let my bed be turned once a day, and the window opened, while the weather is dry. And burn a few billets with some brush in the footman's garret, and see their mattress be dry as a bone. For both our gentlemen have got a sad cold by lying in damp shits at Sir Thomas Balfart's, no more at present, but my service to Saul and the rest of our fellow servants, being, dear Mary Jones, always yours, Wynne Jenkins, October 4. End of section 71. Recording by Tricia G.
Section 72 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 72. To Miss Letitia Willis, at Gloucester. My dear Letty, this method of writing to you from time to time, without any hopes of an answer, affords me, I own, some ease and satisfaction in the midst of my disquiet, as it, in some degree, lightens the burden of affliction. But it is at best a very imperfect enjoyment of friendship, because it admits of no return of confidence and good counsel. I would give the whole world to have your company for a single day. I am heartily tired of this itinerant way of life. I am quite dizzy with a perpetual succession of objects. Besides, it is impossible to travel such a length of way without being exposed to inconveniences, dangers, and disagreeable accidents, which prove very grievous to a poor creature of weak nerves like me, and make me pay very dear for the gratification of my curiosity. Nature never intended me for the busy world. I long for repose and solitude where I can enjoy that disinterested friendship which is not to be found among clouds, and indulge those pleasing reveries that shun the hurry and tumult of fashionable society. Unexperienced as I am in the commerce of life, I have seen enough to give me a disgust to the generality of those who carry it on. There is such malice, treachery, and dissimulation, even among professed friends and intimate companions, as cannot fail to strike a virtuous mind with horror and when vice quits the stage for a moment, her place is immediately occupied by folly, which is often too serious to excite anything but compassion. Perhaps I ought to be silent on the foibles of my poor aunt, but with you, my dear Willis, I have no secrets, and, truly, her weaknesses are such as cannot be concealed. Since the first moment we arrived at Bath, she has been employed constantly in spreading nets for the other sex, and, at length, she has caught a superannuated lieutenant who is in a fair way to make her change her name. My uncle and my brother seem to have no objection to this extraordinary match, which, I make no doubt, will afford abundance of matter for conversation and mirth. For my part, I am too sensible of my own weaknesses, to be diverted with those of other people. At present I have something at heart that employs my whole attention, and keeps my mind in the utmost terror and suspense. Yesterday, in the forenoon, as I stood with my brother at the parlour window of an inn, where we had lodged, a person passed a horseback, whom, gracious heaven, I instantly discovered to be Wilson. He wore a white riding-coat, with the cape buttoned up to his chin. Looking remarkably pale, and passed at a round trot, without seeming to observe us. Indeed, he could not see us, for there was a blind that concealed us from the view. You may guess how I was affected by this apparition. The light forsook my eyes, and I was seized with such a palpitation and trembling that I could not stand. I sat down upon a couch, and strove to compose myself, that my brother might not perceive my agitation. But it was impossible to escape his prying eyes. He had observed the object that alarmed me, and, doubtless, knew him at the first glance. He now looked at me with a stern countenance, then he ran out into the street to see what road the unfortunate horseman had taken. He afterwards dispatched his man for further intelligence, and seemed to meditate some violent design. My uncle, being out of order, we remained another night at the inn, and all day long Jerry acted the part of an indefatigable spy upon my conduct. He watched my very looks with such eagerness of attention, as if he would have penetrated into the utmost recesses of my heart. This may be owing to his regard for my honour, if it is not the effect of his own pride. But he is so hot and violent and unrelenting, that the sight of him alone throws me into a flutter, and really it will not be in my power to afford him any share of my affection, if he persists in persecuting me at this rate. I am afraid he has formed some scheme of vengeance, which will make me completely wretched. I am afraid he suspects some collusion from this appearance of Wilson, Good God! Did he really appear? Or was it only a phantom, a pale spectre to apprise me of his death? Oh, Letty, what shall I do? 
where shall i turn for advice and consolation shall i implore the protection of my uncle who has been always kind and compassionate this must be my last resource i dread the thoughts of making him uneasy and would rather suffer a thousand deaths than live the cause of dissension in the family i cannot conceive the meaning of wilson's coming hither perhaps it was in quest of us in order to disclose his real name and situation but wherefore pass without staying to make the least enquiry my dear willis i am lost in conjecture i have not closed an eye since i saw him all night long have i been tossed about from one imagination to another the reflection finds no resting place i have prayed and sighed and wept plentifully if this terrible suspense continues much longer i shall have another fit of illness and then the whole family will be in confusion if it was consistent with the wise purposes of providence would i were in my grave but it is my duty to be resigned my dearest letty excuse my weakness excuse these blots my tears fall so fast that i cannot keep the paper dry yet i ought to consider that i have as yet no cause to despair but i am such a faint-hearted timorous creature thank god my uncle is much better than he was yesterday he is resolved to pursue our journey straight to wales i hope we shall take gloucester in our way that hope cheers my poor heart i shall once more embrace my best beloved willis and pour all my griefs into her friendly bosom oh heaven is it possible that such happiness is reserved for the dejected and forlorn lydia melford october fourth end of section seventy two Section 73 of The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 73 To Sir Watkin Phillips, Baronet, of Jesus College, Oxford Dear Watkin, I yesterday met with an incident which I believe you will own to be very surprising. As I stood with Liddy at the window of the inn where we had lodged, who should pass by but Wilson, a horseback? i could not be mistaken in the person for i had a full view of him as he advanced i plainly perceived by my sister's confusion that she recognized him at the same time i was equally astonished and incensed at his appearance which i could not but interpret into an insult or something worse i ran out at the gate and seeing him turn the corner of the street i dispatched my servant to observe his motions but the fellow was too late to bring me that satisfaction he told me however that there was an inn called the red lion at that end of the town where he supposed the horseman had alighted but that he would not inquire without further orders I sent him back immediately to know what strangers were in the house, and he returned with a report that there was one Mr. Wilson lately arrived. In consequence of this information, I charged him with a note directed to that gentleman, desiring him to meet me in half an hour in a certain field at the town's end, with a case of pistols in order to decide the difference which could not be determined at our last rencounter. But I did not think proper to subscribe the billet. My man assured me he had delivered it into his own hand, and that having read it he declared he would wait upon the gentleman at the place and time appointed. McAlpin being an old soldier, and luckily sober at the time, I entrusted him with my secret. I ordered him to be within call, and having given him a letter to be delivered to my uncle in case of accident, I repaired to the rendezvous, which was an enclosed field at a little distance from the highway. 
i found my antagonist had already taken his ground wrapped in a dark horseman's coat with a laced hat flapped over his eyes but what was my astonishment when throwing off this wrapper he appeared to be a person whom i had never seen before he had one pistol stuck in a leather belt and another in his hand ready for action and advancing a few steps called to know if i was ready i answered no and desired a parley upon which he turned the muzzle of his piece towards the earth then replaced it in his belt and met me half way when i assured him he was not the man i expected to meet he said it might be so that he had received a slip of paper directed to mr wilson requesting him to come hither and that as there was no other in the place of that name he naturally concluded the note was intended for him and him only i then gave him to understand that i had been injured by a person who assumed that name which person i had actually seen within the hour passing through the street on horseback that hearing there was a mr wilson at the red lion i took it for granted he was the man and in that belief had writ the billet and i expressed my surprise that he who was a stranger to me and my concerns should give me such a rendezvous without taking the trouble to demand a previous explanation he replied that there was no other of his name in the whole country that no such horseman had alighted at the red lion since nine o'clock when he arrived that having had the honour to serve his majesty he thought he could not decently decline any invitation of this kind from what quarter soever it might come and that if any explanation was necessary it did not belong to him to demand it but to the gentleman who summoned him into the field vexed as i was at this adventure i could not help admiring the coolness of this officer whose open countenance prepossessed me in his favour he seemed to be turned of forty wore his own short black hair which curled naturally about his ears and was very plain in his apparel when i begged pardon for the trouble i had given him he received my apology with great good humour he told me that he lived about ten miles off at a small farmhouse which would afford me tolerable lodging if i would come and take diversion of hunting with him for a few weeks in which case we might perhaps find out the man who had given me offence i thanked him very sincerely for his courteous offer which i told him i was not at liberty to accept at present on account of my being engaged in a family party and so we parted with mutual professions of good will and esteem now tell me dear knight what am i to make of this singular adventure am i to suppose that the horseman i saw was really a thing of flesh and blood or a bubble that vanished into air or must i imagine liddy knows more of the matter than she chooses to disclose if i thought her capable of carrying on any clandestine correspondence with such a fellow i should at once discard all tenderness and forget that she was connected with me by the ties of blood but how is it possible that a girl of her simplicity and inexperience should maintain such an intercourse surrounded as she is with so many eyes destitute of all opportunity and shifting quarters every day of her life besides she has solemnly promised no i can't think the girl so base so insensible to the honour of her family what disturbs me chiefly is the impression which these occurrences seem to make upon her spirits these are the symptoms from which i conclude that the rascal has still a hold on her affection surely i have the right to call him a rascal 
and to conclude that his designs are infamous but it shall be my fault if he does not one day repent his presumption i confess i cannot think much less write on this subject with any degree of temper or patience i shall therefore conclude with telling you that we hope to be in wales by the latter end of the month but before that period you will probably hear again from your affectionate j melford october fourth end of section seventy three Section 74 of The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 74 to sir watkin phillips baronet of jesus college oxford dear phillips when i wrote you by last post i did not imagine i should be tempted to trouble you again so soon but i now sit down with a heart so full that it cannot contain itself though i am under such agitation of spirits that you are to expect neither method nor connection in this address we have been this day within a hair's breadth of losing honest matthew bramble in consequence of a cursed accident which i will endeavour to explain in crossing the country to get into the post-road it was necessary to ford a river and we that were a horseback passed without any danger or difficulty but a great quantity of rain having fallen last night and this morning there was such an accumulation of water that a mill-head gave way just as the coach was passing under it and the flood rushed down with such impetuosity as first floated and then fairly overturned the carriage in the middle of the stream Lismahago and I, and the two servants, alighting instantaneously, ran into the river to give all the assistance in our power. Our aunt, Mistress Tabitha, who had the good fortune to be uppermost, was already half-way out of the coach window, when her lover, approaching, disengaged her entirely. But whether his foot slipped, or the burthen was too great, they fell over head and ears in each other's arms. He endeavoured more than once to get up, and even to disentangle himself from her embrace, but she hung about his neck like a millstone, no bad emblem of matrimony, and if my man had not proved a staunch auxiliary, those two lovers would in all probability have gone hand in hand to the shades below. For my part, I was too much engaged to take any cognizance of their distress. I snatched out my sister by the hair of the head, and dragging her to the bank, recollected that my uncle had not yet appeared. Rushing again into the stream, I met Clinker hauling ashore Mistress Jenkins, who looked like a mermaid with her hair dishevelled about her ears but when i asked if his master was safe he forthwith shook her from him and she must have gone to pot if a miller had not seasonably come to her relief as for humphrey he flew like lightning to the coach that was by this time filled with water and diving into it brought up the poor squire to all appearance deprived of life it is not in my power to describe what I felt at this melancholy spectacle. It was such an agony as baffles all description. The faithful clinker, taking him up in his arms as if he had been an infant of six months, carried him ashore, howling most piteously all the way, 
and I followed him in a transport of grief and consternation. When he was laid upon the grass and turned from side to side, a great quantity of water ran out at his mouth. Then he opened his eyes and fetched a deep sigh. Clinker, perceiving these signs of life, immediately tied up his arm with a garter, and, pulling out a horse-fleam, let him blood in the farrier style. At first a few drops only issued from the orifice, but the limb being chafed, in a little time the blood began to flow in a continued stream, and he uttered some incoherent words which were the most welcome sounds that ever saluted my ear. There was a country inn hard by, the landlord of which had by this time come with his people to give their assistance. Thither, my uncle being carried, was undressed and put to bed, wrapped in warm blankets. But having been moved too soon, he fainted away and once more lay without sense or motion, notwithstanding all the efforts of Clinker and the landlord, who bathed his temples with Hungary water, and held a smelling-bottle to his nose. As I had heard of the efficacy of salt in such cases, I ordered all that was in the house to be laid under his head and body, and whether this application had the desired effect or nature of herself prevailed, he in less than a quarter of an hour began to breathe regularly, and soon retrieved his recollection, to the unspeakable joy of all the bystanders. As for Clinker, his brain seemed to be affected. He laughed and wept, and danced about in such a distracted manner that the landlord very judiciously conveyed him out of the room. My uncle, seeing me dropping wet, comprehended the whole of what had happened, and asked if all the company was safe. Being answered in the affirmative, he insisted upon my putting on dry clothes, and having swallowed a little warm wine, desired he might be left to his repose. Before I went to shift myself, I inquired about the rest of the family. I found Mistress Tabitha still delirious from her fright, discharging very copiously the water she had swallowed. She was supported by the captain, distilling drops from his uncurled periwig, so lank and so dank, that he looked like Father Thames without his sedges, embracing Isis while she cascaded in his urn. Mistress Jenkins was present also, in a loose bedgown, without either cap or handkerchief, but she seemed to be as little compos mentis as her mistress, and acted so many cross-purposes in the course of her attendance, that between the two Lismahago had occasion for all his philosophy. As for Liddy, I thought the poor girl would have actually lost her senses. The good woman of the house had shifted her linen and put her into bed, but she was seized with the idea that her uncle had perished, and in this persuasion made a dismal outcry. Nor did she pay the least regard to what I said, when I solemnly assured her he was safe. Mr. Bramble, hearing the noise, and being informed of her apprehension, desired she might be brought into his chamber, and she no sooner received this intimation than she ran thither half-naked, with the wildest expression of eagerness in her countenance. Seeing the squire sitting up in the bed, she sprung forwards, and throwing her arms about his neck, exclaimed in a most pathetic tone, "'Are you?' Are you indeed my uncle, my dear uncle, my best friend, my father? Are you really living, or is it an illusion of my poor brain?" Honest Matthew was so much affected that he could not help shedding tears, while he kissed her forehead, saying, "'My dear Liddy, 
i hope i shall live long enough to show how sensible i am of your affection but your spirits are fluttered child you want rest go to bed and compose yourself well i will she replied but still methinks this cannot be real the coach was full of water my uncle was under us all gracious god he was under water how did you get out tell me that or i shall think this is all a deception in what manner i was brought out i know as little as you do my dear said the squire and truly that is a circumstance of which i want to be informed i would have given him a detail of the whole adventure but he would not hear me until i should change my clothes so that i had only time to tell him that he owed his life to the courage and fidelity of clinker and having given him this hint i conducted my sister to her own chamber this accident happened about three o'clock in the afternoon and in little more than an hour the hurricane was all over but as the carriage was found to be so much damaged that it could not proceed without considerable repairs a blacksmith and wheelwright were immediately sent for to the next market town and we congratulated ourselves on being housed at an inn which though remote from the post-road afforded exceeding good lodging the women being pretty well composed and the men all afoot my uncle sent for his servant and in the presence of lismahago and me accosted him in these words so clinker i find you are resolved i shan't die by water as you have fished me up from the bottom at your own risk you are at least entitled to all the money that was in my pocket and there it is so saying he presented him with a purse containing thirty guineas and a ring nearly of the same value god forbid cried clinker your honour shall excuse me i am a poor fellow but i have a heart oh if your honour did but know how i rejoice to see blessed be his holy name that made me the humble instrument but as for the lucre of gain i renounce it i have done no more than my duty no more than i would have done for the most worthless of my fellow-creatures no more than i would have done for captain lismahago or archie macalpin or any sinner upon earth but for your worship i would go through fire as well as water i do believe it humphrey said the squire but as you think it was your duty to save my life at the hazard of your own i think it is mine to express the sense i have of your extraordinary fidelity and attachment i insist upon your receiving this small token of my gratitude but don't imagine that i look upon this as an adequate recompense for the service you have done me i have determined to settle thirty pounds a year upon you for life and i desire these gentlemen will bear witness to this my intention of which i have a memorandum in my pocket-book lord make me thankful for all these mercies cried clinker sobbing i have been a poor bankrupt from the beginning your honour's goodness found me when i was naked when i was sick and forlorn i understand your honour's looks i would not give offence but my heart is very full and if your worship won't give me leave to speak i must vent it in prayers to heaven for my benefactor when he quitted the room lismahago said he should have a much better opinion of his honesty if he did not whine and cant so abominably but that he had always observed those weeping and praying fellows were hypocrites at bottom mr bramble made no reply to this sarcastic remark 
proceeding from the lieutenant's resentment of clinker having in pure simplicity of heart ranked him with macalpin and the sinners of the earth the landlord being called to receive some orders about the beds told the squire that his house was very much at his service but he was sure he should not have the honour to lodge him and his company. He gave us to understand that his master, who lived hard by, would not suffer us to be at a public house when there was accommodation for us at his own, and that if he had not dined abroad in the neighbourhood he would have undoubtedly come to offer his services at our first arrival. He then launched out in praise of that gentleman whom he had served as butler, representing him as a perfect miracle of goodness and generosity. He said he was a person of great learning, and allowed to be the best farmer in the country, that he had a lady who was as much beloved as himself, and an only son, a very hopeful young gentleman, just recovered from a dangerous fever, which had liked to have proved fatal to the whole family for if the son had died he was sure the parents would not have survived their loss he had not yet finished the encomium of mr dennison when this gentleman arrived in a post-chaise and his appearance seemed to justify all that had been said in his favour he is pretty well advanced in years but hale robust and florid with an ingenuous countenance expressive of good sense and humanity having condoled with us on the accident which had happened he said he was come to conduct us to his habitation where we should be less incommoded than at such a paltry inn and expressed his hope that the ladies would not be the worse for going thither in his carriage as the distance was not above a quarter of a mile my uncle having made a proper return to this courteous exhibition eyed him attentively and then asked if he had not been at oxford a commoner of queen's college when mr dennison answered yes with some marks of surprise look at me then said our squire and let us see if you can recollect the features of an old friend whom you have not seen these forty years the gentleman taking him by the hand and gazing at him earnestly i protest cried he i do think i recall the idea of matthew lloyd of glamorganshire who was student of jesus well remembered my dear friend charles dennison exclaimed my uncle pressing him to his breast i am that very identical matthew lloyd of glamorgan clinker who had just entered the room with some coals for the fire no sooner heard these words than throwing down the scuttle on the toes of lismahago he began to caper as if he was mad crying matthew lloyd of glamorgan oh providence matthew lloyd of glamorgan then clasping my uncle's knees he went on in this manner your worship must forgive me matthew lloyd of glamorgan oh lord sir i can't contain myself i shall lose my senses nay thou hast lost them already i believe said the squire peevishly prithee clinker be quiet what is the matter Humphrey, fumbling in his bosom, pulled out an old wooden snuff-box, which he presented in great trepidation to his master, who, opening it immediately, perceived a small Cornelian seal and two scraps of paper. At sight of these articles he started and changed colour, and casting his eye upon the inscriptions, "'Ha! Ah, how! What!' where cried he is the person here named clinker knocking his own breast could hardly pronounce these words here 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 is matthew lloyd as the certificate showeth humphrey clinker was the name of the farrier that took me prentice 
and who gave you these tokens said my uncle hastily my poor mother on her deathbed replied the other and who was your mother dorothy twyford and please your honour heretofore barkeeper at the angel at chippenham and why were not these tokens produced before my mother told me she had wrote to glamorganshire at the time of my birth but had no answer and that afterwards when she made inquiry there was no such person in that county and so in consequence of my changing my name and going abroad at that very time thy poor mother and thou have been left to want and misery i really am shocked at the consequence of my own folly then laying his hand on clinker's head he added stand forth matthew lloyd you see gentlemen how the sins of my youth rise up in judgment against me here is my direction written with my own hand and a seal which i left at the woman's request and this is a certificate of the child's baptism signed by the curate of the parish the company were not a little surprised at this discovery upon which mr dennison facetiously congratulated both the father and the son for my part i shook my new-found cousin heartily by the hand and lismahago complimented him with the tears in his eyes for he had been hopping about the room swearing in broad scotch and bellowing with the pain occasioned by the fall of the coal-scuttle upon his foot he had even vowed to drive the soul out of the body of that mad rascal but perceiving the unexpected turn which things had taken he wished him joy of his good fortune observing that it went very near his heart as he was like to be a great toe out of pocket by the discovery mr dennison now desired to know for what reason my uncle had changed the name by which he knew him at oxford and our squire satisfied him by answering to this effect i took my mother's name which was lloyd as heir to her lands in glamorganshire but when i came of age i sold that property in order to clear my paternal estate and resumed my real name so that i am now matthew bramble of brambleton hall in monmouthshire at your service and this is my nephew jeremy melford of belfield in the county of glamorgan at that instant the ladies entering the room he presented mistress tabitha as his sister and liddy as his niece the old gentleman saluted them very cordially and seemed struck with the appearance of my sister whom he could not help surveying with a mixture of complacency and surprise sister said my uncle there is a poor relation that recommends himself to your good graces the quondam humphrey clinker is metamorphosed into matthew lloyd and claims the honour of being your carnal kinsman in short the rogue proves to be a crab of my own planting in the days of hot blood and unrestrained libertinism clinker had by this time dropped upon one knee by the side of mistress tabitha who eyeing him askance and flirting her fan with marks of agitation thought proper after some conflict to hold out her hand for him to kiss saying with a demure aspect brother you have been very wicked but i hope you'll live to see the folly of your ways i am very sorry to say the young man whom you have this day acknowledged has more grace and religion by the gift of god than you with all your profane learning and repeated opportunity i do think he has got the trick of the eye and the tip of the nose of my uncle lloyd of fluidwellin 
and as for the long chin it is the very moral of the governor's brother as you have changed his name pray change his dress also that livery does not become any person that hath got our blood in his veins liddy seemed much pleased with this acquisition to the family she took him by the hand declaring she should always be proud to own her connection with a virtuous young man who had given so many proofs of his gratitude and affection to her uncle mistress winifred jenkins extremely fluttered between her surprise at this discovery and the apprehension of losing her sweetheart exclaimed in a giggling tone i wish you joy mr clinker floyd i would say <laughs> you'll be so proud you won't look at your poor fellow servants <laughs> honest clinker owned he was overjoyed at his good fortune which was greater than he deserved but wherefore should i be proud said he a poor object conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity nursed in a parish workhouse and bred in a smithy whenever i seem proud mistress jenkins i beg of you to put me in mind of the condition i was in when i first saw you between chippenham and marlborough when this momentous affair was discussed to the satisfaction of all parties concerned the weather being dry the ladies declined the carriage so that we walked all together to mr dennison's house where we found the tea ready prepared by his lady an amiable matron who received us with all the benevolence of hospitality the house is old-fashioned and irregular but lodgeable and commodious to the south it has the river in front at the distance of a hundred paces and on the north there is a rising ground covered with an agreeable plantation the greens and walks are kept in the nicest order and all is rural and romantic i have not yet seen the young gentleman who is on a visit to a friend in the neighbourhood from whose house he is not expected till to-morrow in the meantime as there is a man going to the next market town with letters for the post i take this opportunity to send you the history of this day which has been remarkably full of adventures and you will own i give you them like a beefsteak at dolly's hot and hot without ceremony and parade just as they come from the recollection of yours j melford end of section 74section 75 of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by deborah lynn the expedition of humphrey clinker by tobias smollett section 75 to dr lewis dear dick since the last trouble i gave you i have met with a variety of incidents some of them of a singular nature, which I reserve as a fund for conversation, but there are others so interesting that they will not keep in petto till meeting. Know, then, it was a thousand pounds to a sixpence that you should now be executing my will instead of perusing my letter. Two days ago our coach was overturned in the midst of a rapid river where my life was saved with the utmost difficulty by the courage, activity, and presence of mind of my servant Humphrey Clinker but this is not the most surprising circumstance of the adventure the said humphrey clinker proves to be matthew lloyd natural son of one matthew lloyd of glamorgan if you know any such person you see doctor that notwithstanding all your philosophy it is not without some reason that the welshmen ascribe such energy to the force of blood but we shall discuss this point on some future occasion this is not the only discovery which i made in consequence of our disaster we happened to be wrecked upon a friendly shore. The lord of the manor is no other than Charles Dennison, our fellow rake at Oxford. We are now happily housed with that gentleman, who 
who has really attained to that pitch of rural felicity at which I have been aspiring these twenty years in vain. He is blessed with a consort whose disposition is suited to his own in all respects, tender, generous, and benevolent. She, moreover, possesses an uncommon share of understanding, fortitude, and discretion, and is admirably qualified to be his companion, confidant, counsellor, and coadjutrix. These excellent persons have an only son, about nineteen years of age, just such a youth as they could have wished that heaven would bestow to fill up the measure of their enjoyment. In a word, they know no other allay to their happiness but their apprehension and anxiety about the life and concerns of this beloved object. Our old friend, who had the misfortune to be a second brother, was bred to the law, and even called to the bar, but he did not find himself qualified to shine in that province, and had very little inclination for his profession. He disobliged his father by marrying for love without any consideration of fortune, so that he had little or nothing to depend upon for some years but his practice, which afforded him a bare subsistence, and the prospect of an increasing family began to give him disturbance and disquiet. In the meantime, his father, dying, was succeeded by his elder brother, a fox-hunter and a sot, who neglected his affairs, insulted and oppressed his servants, and in a few years had well-nigh ruined the estate, when he was happily carried off by a fever, the immediate consequence of a debauch. Charles, with the approbation of his wife, immediately determined to quit business and retire into the country, although this resolution was strenuously and zealously opposed by every individual whom he consulted on the subject. Those who had tried the experiment assured him that he could not pretend to breathe in the country for less than the double of what his estate produced, that in order to be upon the footing of a gentleman he would be obliged to keep horses, hounds, carriages, with a suitable number of servants, and maintain an elegant table for the entertainment of his neighbours. That farming was a mystery known only to those who had been bred up to it from the cradle, the success of it depending not only upon skill and industry, but also upon such attention and economy as no gentleman could be supposed to give or practice. Accordingly, every attempt made by gentlemen miscarried, and not a few had been ruined by their prosecution of agriculture. Nay, they affirmed that he would find it cheaper to buy hay and oats for his cattle, and to go to market for poultry, eggs, kitchen herbs, and roots, and even the most inconsiderable article of housekeeping, than to have those articles produced on his own ground. These objections did not deter Mr. Dennison, because they were chiefly founded on the supposition that he would be obliged to lead a life of extravagance and dissipation, which he and his consort equally detested, despised, and determined to avoid. The objects he had in view were health of body, peace of mind, and the private satisfaction of domestic quiet, unallayed by actual want, and uninterrupted by the fears of indigence. He was very moderate in his estimate of the necessaries, and even of the comforts of life. He required nothing but wholesome air, pure water, agreeable exercise, plain diet, convenient lodging, and decent apparel. He reflected that if a peasant without education, or any great share of natural sagacity, could maintain a large family, and even become opulent upon a farm for which he paid an annual rent of two or three hundred pounds to the landlord, surely he himself might hope for some success from his industry, having no rent to pay, but on the contrary three or four hundred pounds a year to receive. He considered that the earth was an indulgent mother that yielded her fruits to all her children without distinction. He had studied the theory of agriculture with a degree of eagerness and delight, and he could not conceive there was any mystery in the practice, but what he should be able to disclose by dint of care and application. With respect to household expense, he entered into a minute detail and investigation, by which he perceived the assertions of his friends were altogether erroneous. He found he should save sixty pounds a year in the single article of house rent, and as much more in pocket money and contingencies, that even butcher's meat was twenty per cent cheaper in the country than in London but that poultry and almost every other circumstance of housekeeping might be had for less than one half of what they cost in town. Besides, a considerable saving on the side of dress, and being delivered from the oppressive imposition of ridiculous modes, invented by ignorance and adopted by folly. As to the danger of vying with the rich in pomp and equipage, it never gave him the least disturbance. He was now turned of forty, and having lived half that time in the busy scenes of life, was well skilled in the science of mankind. There cannot be in nature a more contemptible figure than that of a man who, with five hundred a year, presumes to rival in expense a neighbour who possesses five times that income. 
His ostentation, far from concealing, serves only to discover his indigence, and render his vanity the more shocking, for it attracts the eyes of censure, and excites the spirit of inquiry. There is not a family in the county, nor a servant in his own house, nor a farmer in the parish, but what knows the utmost farthing that his lands produce, and all these behold him with scorn or compassion. I am surprised that these reflections do not occur to persons in this unhappy dilemma, and produce a salutary effect. But the truth is, of all the passions incident to human nature, vanity is that which most effectually perverts the faculties of the understanding. Nay, it sometimes becomes so incredibly depraved as to aspire at infamy, and find pleasure in bearing the stigmas of reproach. I have now given you a sketch of the character and situation of Mr. Dennison when he came down to take possession of this estate. But as the messenger, who carries the letters to the next town, is just setting off, I shall reserve what further I have to say on this subject till the next post, when you shall certainly hear from yours always, Matt Bramble, October 8. End of section 75section seventy six of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by deborah lynn the expedition of humphrey clinker by tobias smollett section seventy six to dr lewis once more dear doctor i resume the pen for your amusement it was on the morning after our arrival that, walking out with my friend, Mr. Dennison, I could not help breaking forth into the warmest expressions of applause at the beauty of the scene, which is really enchanting, and I signified, in particular, how much I was pleased with the disposition of some detached groves that afforded at once shelter and ornament to his habitation. "'When I took possession of these lands about two and twenty years ago,' said he, there was not a tree standing within a mile of the house, except those of an old neglected orchard which produced nothing but leaves and moss. It was in the gloomy month of November when I arrived, and found the house in such a condition that it might have been justly styled the Tower of Desolation. The courtyard was covered with nettles and docks, and the garden exhibited such a rank plantation of weeds as I had never seen before. The window-shutters were falling in pieces, the sashes broken, and owls and jackdaws had taken possession of the chimneys. The prospect within was still more dreary. All was dark and damp and dirty beyond description. The rain penetrated in several parts of the roof. In some apartments the very floors had given way. The hangings were parted from the walls and shaking in mouldy remnants. The glasses were dropping out of their frames. The family pictures were covered with dust, and all the chairs and tables worm-eaten and crazy. There was not a bed in the house that could be used except one old-fashioned machine with a high gilt tester and fringed curtains of yellow mohair, which had been, for aught I know, two centuries in the family. In short, there was no furniture but the utensils of the kitchen, and the cellar afforded nothing but a few empty butts and barrels that stunk so abominably that I would not suffer anybody to enter it until I had flashed a considerable quantity of gunpowder to qualify the foul air within." An old cottager and his wife, who were hired to lie in the house, had left it with precipitation, alleging, among other causes of retreat, that they could not sleep for frightful noises, and that my poor brother certainly walked after his death. In a word, the house appeared uninhabitable. The barn, stable, and outhouses were in ruins, all the fences broken down, and the fields lying waste. The farmer who kept the key never dreamed I had any intention to live upon the spot. He rented a farm of sixty pounds, and his lease was just expiring. He had formed a scheme of being appointed bailiff to the estate, and of converting the house and the adjacent grounds to his own use. A hint of his intention I received from the curate at my first arrival. I therefore did not pay much regard to what he said by way of discouraging me from coming to settle in the country. But I was a little startled when he gave me warning that he should quit the farm at the expiration of his lease, unless I could abate considerably in the rent. At this period I accidentally became acquainted with a person whose friendship laid the foundation of all my prosperity. In the next market town I chanced to dine at an inn with a Mr. Wilson, who was lately come to settle in the neighbourhood. He had been lieutenant of a man of war, but quitted the sea in some disgust, and married the only daughter of Farmer Bland, who lives in this parish, and has acquired a good fortune in the way of husbandry. 
Wilson is one of the best-natured men I ever knew, brave, frank, obliging, and ingenuous. He liked my conversation, I was charmed with his liberal manner, and acquaintance immediately commenced, and this was soon improved into a friendship without reserve. There are characters which, like similar particles of matter, strongly attract each other. He forthwith introduced me to his father-in-law, Farmer Bland, who was well acquainted with every acre of my estate, of consequence well qualified to advise me on this occasion. Finding I was inclined to embrace a country life, and even to amuse myself with the occupation of farming, he approved of my design. He gave me to understand that all my farms were underlet, that the estate was capable of great improvement, that there was plenty of chalk in the neighbourhood, and that my own ground produced excellent marl for manure. With respect to the farm, which was like to fall into my hands, he said he would willingly take it at the present rent, but at the same time owned that if I would expend two hundred pounds in enclosure, it would be worth more than double the sum. Thus encouraged, I began the execution of my scheme without further delay, and plunged into a sea of expense, though I had no fund in reserve, and the whole produce of the estate did not exceed three hundred pounds a year. In one week my house was made weather-tight, and thoroughly cleansed from top to bottom. Then it was well ventilated by throwing all the doors and windows open, and making blazing fires of wood in every chimney from the kitchen to the garrets. The floors were repaired, the sashes new glazed, and out of the old furniture of the whole house I made shift to fit up a parlour and three chambers in a plain yet decent manner. The courtyard was cleared of weeds and rubbish, and my friend Wilson charged himself with the dressing of the garden. Bricklayers were set at work upon the barn and stable, and labourers engaged to restore the fences and begin the work of hedging and ditching, under the direction of Farmer Bland, at whose recommendation I hired a careful hind to lie in the house and keep constant fires in the apartments. Having taken these measures, I returned to London, where I forthwith sold off my household furniture, and in three weeks from my first visit brought my wife hither to keep her Christmas. Considering the gloomy season of the year, the dreariness of the place, and the decayed aspect of our habitation, I was afraid that her resolution would sink under the sudden transition from a town life to such a melancholy state of rustication. But I was agreeably disappointed. She found the reality less uncomfortable than the picture I had drawn. By this time, indeed, things were mended in appearance. The outhouses had risen out of their ruins, the pigeon-house was rebuilt and replenished by Wilson, who also put my garden in decent order and provided a good stock of poultry, which made an agreeable figure in my yard. And the house, on the whole, looked like the habitation of human creatures. Farmer Bland spared me a milch-cow for my family, and an ordinary saddle-horse for my servant to go to market at the next town. I hired a country lad for a footman, the hind's daughter was my housemaid, and my wife had brought a cook-maid from London. Such was my family when I began housekeeping in this place, with three hundred pounds in my pocket, raised from the sale of my superfluous furniture. I knew we should find occupation enough through the day to employ our time, but I dreaded the long winter evenings. Yet, for those two, we found a remedy. The curate, who was a single man, soon became so naturalized to the family that he generally lay in the house, and his company was equally agreeable and useful. He was a modest man, a good scholar, and perfectly well qualified to instruct me in such country matters as I wanted to know. Mr. Wilson brought his wife to see us, and she became so fond of Mrs. Dennison that she said she was never so happy as when she enjoyed the benefit of her conversation. She was then a fine buxom country lass, exceedingly docile, and as good-natured as her husband, Jack Wilson, so that a friendship ensued among the women, which hath continued to this day. As for Jack, he hath been my constant companion, counsellor, and commissary. I would not for a hundred pounds you should leave my house without seeing him. Jack is an universal genius. His talents are really astonishing. He is an excellent carpenter, joiner, and turner, and a cunning artist in iron and brass. He not only superintended my economy, but also presided over my pastimes. He taught me to brew beer, to make cider, perry, mead, escobar, and plague water, to cook several outlandish delicacies such as olives, pepper-pots, pillaws, corries, chababs, and stuffetas. He understands all manner of games from chess down to chuck-farthing, sings a good song, plays upon the violin, and dances a hornpipe with surprising agility. 
He and I walked and rode and hunted and fished together, without minding the vicissitudes of the weather, and I am persuaded that in a raw, moist climate like this of England, continual exercise is as necessary as food to the preservation of the individual. In the course of two and twenty years there has not been one hour's interruption or abatement in the friendship subsisting between Wilson's family and mine. And, what is a rare instance of good fortune, that friendship is continued to our children. His son and mine are nearly of the same age and the same disposition. They have been bred up together at the same school and college, and love each other with the warmest affection. By Wilson's means I likewise formed an acquaintance with a sensible physician, who lives in the next market town, and his sister, an agreeable old maiden, passed the Christmas holidays at our house. Meanwhile, I began my farming with great eagerness, and that very winter planted these groves that please you so much. As for the neighboring gentry, I had no trouble from that quarter during my first campaign. They were all gone to town before I settled in the country, and by the summer I had taken measures to defend myself from their attacks. When a gay equipage came to my gates, I was never at home. Those who visited me in a modest way I received, and according to the remarks I made on their characters in conversation, either rejected their advances or returned their civility. I was in general despised among the fashionable company as a low fellow, both in breeding and circumstances. Nevertheless, I found a few individuals of moderate fortune, who gladly adopted my style of living, and many others would have acceded to our society, had they not been prevented by the pride, envy, and ambition of their wives and daughters. Those, in times of luxury and dissipation, are the rocks upon which all the small estates in the country are wrecked. I reserved in my own hands some acres of ground adjacent to the house for making experiments in agriculture, according to the directions of Lyle, Tull, Hart, Duhamel, and others who have written on this subject, and qualified their theory with the practical observations of Farmer Bland, who was my great master in the art of husbandry. In short, I became enamoured of a country life, and my success greatly exceeded my expectation. I drained bogs, burned heath, grubbed up firs and fern. I planted copse and willows where nothing else would grow. I gradually enclosed all my farms, and made such improvements that my estate now yields me clear twelve hundred pounds a year. All this time my wife and I have enjoyed uninterrupted health and a regular flow of spirits, except on a very few occasions when our cheerfulness was invaded by such accidents as are inseparable from the condition of life. I lost two children in their infancy by the smallpox, so that I have one son only, in whom all our hopes are centred. He went yesterday to visit a friend, with whom he has stayed all night, but he will be here to dinner. I shall this day have the pleasure of presenting him to you and your family, and I flatter myself you will find him not altogether unworthy of our affection. The truth is, either I am blinded by the partiality of a parent, or he is a boy of very amiable character and yet his conduct has given us unspeakable disquiet. You must know we had projected a match between him and a gentleman's daughter in the next county, who will in all probability be heiress of a considerable fortune. But it seems he had a personal disgust to the alliance. He was then at Cambridge, and tried to gain time on various pretenses. But being pressed in letters by his mother and me to give a definitive answer, he fairly gave his tutor the slip, and disappeared about eight months ago. Before he took this rash step, he wrote me a letter, explaining his objections to the match, and declaring that he would keep himself concealed until he should understand that his parents would dispense with his contracting an engagement that must make him miserable for life, and he prescribed the form of advertising in a certain newspaper by which he might be apprised of our sentiments on this subject. You may easily conceive how much we were alarmed and afflicted by this elopement, which he had made without dropping the least hint to his companion, Charles Wilson, who belonged to the same college. We resolved to punish him with the appearance of neglect, in hopes that he would return of his own accord. But he maintained his purpose till the young lady chose a partner for herself. Then he produced himself, and made his peace by the mediation of Wilson. Suppose we should unite our families by joining him with your niece, who is one of the most lovely creatures I ever beheld. My wife is already as fond of her as if she were her own child, and I have a presentiment that my son will be captivated by her at first sight. Nothing could be more agreeable to all our family, said I, than such an alliance. But, my dear friend, candour obliges me to tell you that I am afraid Liddy's heart is not wholly disengaged. 
"'There is a cursed obstacle.' "'You mean the young stroller, Gloucester?' said he. "'You are surprised that I should know this circumstance? "'But you will be more surprised when I tell you "'that stroller is no other than my son, George Dennison. "'That was the character he assumed in his eclipse.' "'I am indeed astonished and overjoyed,' cried I, "'and shall be happy beyond expression to see your proposal take effect.' He then gave me to understand that the young gentleman, at his emerging from concealment, had disclosed his passion for Miss Melford, the niece of Mr. Bramble, of Monmouthshire. Though Mr. Dennison little dreamed that this was his old friend Matthew Lloyd, he nevertheless furnished his son with proper credentials, and he had been at Bath, London, and many other places in quest of us to make himself and his pretensions known. The bad success of his enquiry had such an effect upon his spirits that immediately at his return he was seized with a dangerous fever which overwhelmed his parents with terror and affliction but he was now happily recovered though still weak and disconsolate my nephew joining us in our walk i informed him of these circumstances with which he was wonderfully pleased he declared he would promote the match to the utmost of his power and that he longed to embrace young mr dennison as his friend and brother Meanwhile the father went to desire his wife to communicate this discovery gradually to Liddy, that her delicate nerves might not suffer too sudden a shock, and I imparted the particulars to my sister Tabby, who expressed some surprise, not altogether unmixed, I believe, with an emotion of envy, for though she could have no objection to an alliance at once so honourable and advantageous, she hesitated in giving her consent on pretence of the youth and inexperience of the parties, at length, however, she acquiesced, in consequence of having consulted with Captain Lismahago. Mr. Dennison took care to be in the way when his son arrived at the gate, and without giving him time or opportunity to make any enquiry about the strangers, brought him upstairs to be presented to Mr. Lloyd and his family. The first person he saw when he entered the room was Liddy, who, notwithstanding all her preparations, stood trembling in the utmost confusion. At sight of this object he was fixed motionless to the floor, and gazing at her with the utmost eagerness of astonishment, exclaimed, "'Sacred heaven, what is this? Ha! Wherefore?' Here, his speech failing, he stood straining his eyes in the most emphatic silence. "'George,' said his father, "'this is my friend, Mr. Lloyd.' Roused at this intimation, he turned and received my salute, when I said, "'Young gentleman,' "'If you had trusted me with your secret at our last meeting, "'we should have parted upon better terms.' "'Before he could make any answer, "'Jerry came round and stood before him with open arms. "'At first he started and changed colour, "'but after a short pause he rushed into his embrace, "'and they hugged one another as if they had been intimate friends from their infancy. "'Then he paid his respects to Mrs. Tabitha, "'and advancing to Liddy, "'Is it possible,' cried he, "'that my senses did not play me false?' that I see Miss Melford under my father's roof, that I am permitted to speak to her without giving offence, and that her relations have honoured me with their countenance and protection? Liddy blushed and trembled and faltered. "'To be sure, sir,' said she, "'it is a very surprising circumstance, a great, a providential, I really know not what I say, but I beg you will think I have said what's agreeable.' Mrs. Dennison interposing said, "'Compose yourselves, my dear children,' "'Your mutual happiness shall be our peculiar care.' "'The son, going up to his mother, kissed one hand, "'my niece bathed the other with her tears, "'and the good old lady pressed them both in their turns to her breast. "'The lovers were too much affected to get rid of their embarrassment for one day, "'but the scene was much enlivened by the arrival of Jack Wilson, "'who brought, as usual, some game of his own killing. "'His honest countenance was a good letter of recommendation. "'I received him like a dear friend after a long separation,' and I could not help wondering to see him shake Jerry by the hand as an old acquaintance. They had, indeed, been acquainted some days in consequence of a diverting incident which I shall explain at meeting. That same night a consultation was held upon the concerns of the lovers, when the match was formally agreed to, and all the marriage articles were settled without the least dispute. My nephew and I promised to make Liddy's fortune five thousand pounds, Mr. Dennison declared he would make over one half of his estate immediately to his son, and that his daughter-in-law should be secured in a jointure of four hundred. Tabby proposed that, considering their youth, they should undergo one year at least of probation before the indissoluble knot should be tied, but the young gentleman being very impatient and importunate, and the scheme implying that the young couple should live in the house under the wings of his parents, 
we resolved to make them happy without further delay. As the law requires that the parties should be some weeks resident in the parish, we shall stay here till the ceremony is performed. Mr. Lismahago requests that he may take the benefit of the same occasion, so that next Sunday the bands will be published for all four together. I doubt I shall not be able to pass my Christmas with you at Brambleton Hall. Indeed, I am so agreeably situated in this place that I have no desire to shift my quarters, and I foresee that when the day of separation comes there will be abundance of sorrow on all sides. In the meantime, we must make the most of those blessings which heaven bestows. Considering how you are tethered by your profession, I cannot hope to see you so far from home. Yet the distance does not exceed a summer day's journey, and Charles Dennison, who desires to be remembered to you, would be rejoiced to see his old computator. But as I am now stationary, I expect regular answers to the epistles of Yours invariably, Matt Bramble, October 11. End of section 76「Section 77 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson – The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett – Section 77 to sir watkin phillips baronet at oxford dear watt every day is now big with incident and discovery young mr dennison proves to be no other than that identical person whom i have execrated so long under the name of wilson he had eloped from college at cambridge to avoid a match that he detested and acted in different parts of the country as a stroller until the lady in question made choice of a husband for herself then he returned to his father and disclosed his passion for liddy which met with the approbation of his parents though the father little imagined that mr bramble was his old companion matthew lloyd the young gentleman being empowered to make honourable proposals to my uncle and me, had been in search of us all over England, without effect, and he it was whom I had seen pass on horseback by the window of the inn where I stood with my sister, but he little dreamed that we were in the house. As for the real Mr. Wilson, whom I called forth to combat by mistake, he is the neighbour and intimate friend of old Mr. Dennison, and this connection had suggested to the son the idea of taking that name while he remained in obscurity. You may easily conceive what pleasure I must have felt on discovering that the honour of our family was in no danger from the conduct of a sister whom I love with uncommon affection that instead of debasing her sentiments and views to a wretched stroller she had really captivated the heart of a gentleman her equal in rank and superior in fortune and that as his parents approved of the attachment i was on the eve of acquiring a brother-in-law so worthy of my friendship and esteem George Dennison is, without all question, one of the most accomplished young fellows in England. His person is at once elegant and manly, and his understanding highly cultivated. Though his spirit is lofty, his heart is kind, and his manner so engaging as to command veneration and love, even from malice and indifference. When I weigh my own character with his, I am ashamed to find myself so light in the balance. But the comparison excites no envy. I propose him as a model for imitation. I have endeavoured to recommend myself to his friendship, and hope I have already found a place in his affection. I am, however, mortified to reflect what flagrant injustice we every day commit, and what absurd judgment we form, 
in viewing objects through the falsifying mediums of prejudice and passion had you asked me a few days ago the picture of wilson the player i should have drawn a portrait very unlike the real person and character of george dennison without all doubt the greatest advantage acquired in travelling and perusing mankind in the original is that of dispelling those shameful clouds that darken the faculties of the mind preventing it from judging with candour and precision the real wilson is a great original and the best tempered companionable man i ever knew i question if ever he was angry or low-spirited in his life he makes no pretensions to letters but he is an adept in everything else that can be either useful or entertaining among other qualifications he is a complete sportsman and counted the best shot in the county he and dennison and lismahago and i attended by clinker went a-shooting yesterday and made a great havoc among the partridges to-morrow we shall take the field against the woodcocks and snipes in the evening we dance and sing or play at commerce loo and quadrille mr dennison is an elegant poet and has written some detached pieces on the subject of his passion for liddy which must be very flattering to the vanity of a young woman perhaps he is one of the greatest theatrical geniuses that ever appeared he sometimes entertains us with reciting favourite speeches from our best plays we are resolved to convert the great hall into a theatre and get up the beau's stratagem without delay i think i shall make no contemptible figure in the character of scrub and lismahago will be very great in captain gibbet wilson undertakes to entertain the country people with harlequin skeleton for which he has got a jacket ready painted with his own hand our society is really enchanting even the severity of lismahago relaxes and the vinegar of miss tabby is remarkably dulcified ever since it was agreed that she should take precedency of her niece in being first noosed for you must know the date is fixed for liddy's marriage and the banns for both couples have been already once published in the parish church the captain earnestly begged that one trouble might serve for all and tabitha assented with a vile affectation of reluctance her inamorato who came hither very slenderly equipped has sent for his baggage to london which in all probability will not arrive in time for the wedding but it is of no great consequence as everything is to be transacted with the utmost privacy meanwhile directions are given for making out the contracts of marriage which are very favourable for both females liddy will be secured in a good jointure and her aunt will remain mistress of her own fortune except one half of the interest which her husband shall have a right to enjoy for his natural life i think this as little in conscience as can be done for a man who yokes with such a partner for life these expectants seem to be so happy that if mr dennison had an agreeable daughter i believe i should be for making the third couple in this country dance the humour seems to be infectious for clinker alias lloyd has a month's mind to play the fool in the same fashion with mistress winifred jenkins he has even sounded me on the subject but i have given him no encouragement to prosecute this scheme i told him i thought he might do better as there was no engagement nor promise subsisting that i did not know what designs my uncle might have formed for his advantage but i was of opinion that he should not at present run the risk of disobliging him by any premature application of this nature 
honest humphrey protested he would suffer death sooner than do or say anything that should give offence to the squire but he owned he had a kindness for the young woman and had reason to think she looked upon him with a favourable eye that he considered this mutual manifestation of goodwill as an engagement understood which ought to be binding to the conscience of an honest man and he hoped the squire and i would be of the same opinion when we should be at leisure to bestow any thought about the matter i believe he is in the right and we shall find time to take his case into consideration you see we are fixed for some weeks at least and as you have had a long respite i hope you will begin immediately to discharge the arrears due to your affectionate j melford october fourteenth end of section seventy seven section seventy eight of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett Section 78 To Miss Letitia Willis at Gloucester My dear, dear Letty, never did I sit down to write in such agitation as I now feel. In the course of a few days we have met with a number of incidents so wonderful and interesting that all my ideas are thrown into confusion and perplexity. You must not expect either method or coherence in what I am going to relate, my dearest Willis. Since my last, the aspect of affairs is totally changed, and so changed. But I would fain give you a regular detail. In passing a river about eight days ago, our coach was overturned, and some of us and some of us narrowly escaped with life. My uncle had well-nigh perished. Oh, heaven! I cannot reflect upon that circumstance without horror. I should have lost my best friend, my father and protector, but for the resolution and activity of his servant, Humphrey Clinker, whom Providence really seems to have placed near him for the necessity of this occasion. I would not be thought superstitious, but surely he acted from a stronger impulse than common fidelity. Was it not the voice of nature that loudly called upon him to save the life of his own father? For, O oh Letty, it was discovered that Humphrey Clinker was my uncle's natural son. Almost at the same instant, a gentleman, who came to offer us his assistance, and invite us to his house, turned out to be a very old friend of Mr. Bramble. His name is Mr. Dennison, one of the worthiest men living, and his lady is a perfect saint upon earth. They have an only son, who do you think is this only son? O oh, Letty, O oh, gracious heaven, how my heart palpitates when I tell you that this only son of Mr. Dennison's is that very identical youth who, under the name of Wilson, has made such ravage in my heart. Yes, my dear friend, Wilson and I are now lodged in the same house, and converse together freely. His father approves of his sentiments in my favour. His mother loves me with all the tenderness of a parent." My uncle, my aunt, and my brother no longer oppose my inclinations. On the contrary, they have agreed to make us happy without delay, and in three weeks or a month, if no unforeseen accident intervenes, your friend Lydia Melford will have changed her name and condition. I say, if no accident intervenes, because such a torrent of success makes me tremble. I wish there may not be something treacherous in this sudden reconciliation of fortune. I have no merit, I have no title to such felicity. Far from enjoying the prospect that lies before me, my mind is harassed with a continued tumult, made up of hopes and wishes, doubts and apprehensions. I can neither eat nor sleep, and my spirits are in perpetual flutter. I more than ever feel that vacancy in my heart, which your presence alone can fill. The mind, in every disquiet, seeks to repose itself on the bosom of a friend. And this is such a trial as I really know not how to support without your company and counsel. I must, therefore, dear Letty, put your friendship to the test. I must beg you will come and do the last offices of maidenhood to your companion, Lydia Melford. This letter goes enclosed in one to our worthy governess, from Mrs. Dennison, entreating her to interpose with your mamma. 
that you may be allowed to favour us with your company on this occasion, and I flatter myself that no material objection can be made to our request. The distance from hence to Gloucester does not exceed one hundred miles, and the roads are good. Mr. Clinker, alias Lloyd, shall be sent over to attend your motions. If you step into the post-chaise with your maid Betty Barker, at seven in the morning, you'll arrive by four in the afternoon at the halfway house, where there is good accommodation. There you shall be met by my brother and myself, who will next day conduct you to this place, where, I am sure, you will find yourself perfectly at your ease in the midst of an agreeable society. Dear Letty, I will take no refusal. If you have any friendship, any humanity, you will come. I desire that immediate application may be made to your mamma, and that, the moment her permission is obtained, you will apprise. Your ever-faithful, Lydia Melford, October 14th. End of section 78section seventy nine of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the expedition of humphrey clinker by tobias smollett section seventy nine to mrs germain at her house in gloucester dear madam though i was not so fortunate as to be favoured with an answer to the letter with which i troubled you in the spring i still flatter myself that you retain some regard for me and my concerns i am sure the care and tenderness with which i was treated under your roof and tuition demand the warmest returns of gratitude and affection on my part and these sentiments i hope i shall cherish to my dying day at present i think it my duty to make you acquainted with the happy issue of that indiscretion by which I incurred your displeasure. Ah, madam, the slighted Wilson is metamorphosed into George Dennison, only son and heir of a gentleman whose character is second to none in England, as you may understand upon inquiry. My guardian, my brother and I, are now in his house, and an immediate union of the two families is to take place in the persons of the young gentleman and your poor Lydia Melford you will easily conceive how embarrassing the situation must be to a young inexperienced creature like me of weak nerves and strong apprehensions and how much the presence of a friend and confidant would encourage and support me on this occasion you know that of all the young ladies miss willis was she that possessed the greatest share of my confidence and affection and therefore i fervently wish to have the happiness of her company at this interesting crisis mrs Denison, who is the object of universal love and esteem has at my request written to you on the subject and i now beg leave to reinforce her solicitations my dear mrs jermyn my ever honoured governess let me conjure you by that fondness which once distinguished your favourite lydia by that benevolence of heart which disposes you to promote the happiness of your fellow-creatures in general lend a favourable ear to my petition and use your influence with letty's mamma that my most earnest desire may be gratified. Should I be indulged in this particular, I will engage to return her safe, and even to accompany her to Gloucester, where, if you will give me leave, I will present to you under another name. Dear Madam, your most affectionate, humble servant, and penitent, Lydia Melford. October 14th End of section 79 Section 80 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 80. To Mrs. Mary Jones at Brambleton Hall. Oh, Mary Jones! Mary Jones! I have met with so many accidents, surprisals, and terrifications that I am in a pathic fantigo, and I believe I shall never be my own self again. Last week I was dragged out of a river like a drowned rat, and lost a brand new nightcap with a sulphur stay hook that cost me a good half a crown, and an odd shoe of green gala monkey, besides wetting my clothes and tearing my smock, and an ugly gash made in the back part of my thigh 
by the stump of a tree. To be sure, Mr. Clinker tuck me out of the cocks, but he left me on my back in the water to go to the squire, and I might have had a watery grave if a millar had not brought me to the dry land. But, oh, what choppings and changes, girl! The player man that came after Miss Liddy, and frightened me with a beard at Bristol well, is now Matthew Murphyed into a fine young gentleman, son and heir of Squire Dollison. We are all together in the same house, and all parties have agreed to the match, and in a fortnight the ceremony will be performed. But this is not the only wedding we are to have. Mistress is resolved to have the same frolic in the name of God. Last Sunday in the parish crutch, if my own ours may be trusted, the clerk called the banes of marriage betwixt Openiah Lesha Mahago and Tabitha Bramble spinster. He might as well have called her Inkle Weaver, for she never spun an hank of yarn in her life. Young Squire Dollison and Miss Liddy make the second kipple, and there might have been a turd, but times are changed with Mr. Clinker. Oh, Molly, what dost think? Mr. Clinker is found to be a pieblow of our own squire, and his right name is Mr. Matthew Lloyd, though of God he knows how that can be. And he is now out of livery and wears ruffles. But I knew him when he was out at elbows, and had not a rag to kiver his pister a rose. So he need not hold his head so high. He is for sartain very umble and complaisant, and protests as how he has the same regard as before but that he is no longer his own master, and cannot pretend to marry without the squire's consent. He says he must wait with patience, and trust to providence and such nonsense. But if so be as how his regard is the same, why stand shilly-shally? Why not strike while the iron is hot, and speak to the squire without loss of time? What subjection can the squire make to our coming together? Though if my father wanted a gentleman, my mother was an honest woman. I didn't come on the wrong side of the blanket, girl. My parents were married according to the right of Holy Mother Crutch, in the face of men and angles. Mark that, Mary Jones. Mr. Clinker, Lloyd, I would say, had best look to his tackle. There be other chaps in the market, as the saying is. What would he say if I should accept the suit and service of the young squire's valley? Mr. Machappy is a gentleman born, and has been abroad in the wars. He has a world of buck learning, and speaks French, and ditch, and scotch, and all manner of outlandish lingos. To be sure, he's a little the worse for the wear, and is much given to drink. But then he's good-tempered in his liquor, and a prudent woman might wind him about her finger. But I have no thoughts of him, I'll assure you. I scorn for to do, or to say, or to think anything that might give unbreach to Mr. Lloyd, without further occasion. But then I have such vapours, Molly, I sit and cry by myself, and take ass of etida, and smill to burned fathers, and kindle snuffs. And I pray constantly for Greece, that I may have a glimpse of the new light, to show me the way through this wretched veil of tears. And yet I want for nothing in this family of love, where every soul is so kind and so courteous, that one would think they are so many saints in haven." Dear Molly, I recommend myself to your prayers, being, with my service to Saul, your ever-loving and discounseled friend, Win Jenkins, October 14. End of section 80. Recording by Tricia G. Section 81 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 81. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Dick, You cannot imagine what pleasure I have in seeing your handwriting after such a long cessation on your side of our correspondence. Yet, heaven knows, I have often seen your handwriting with disgust. I mean, when it appeared in abbreviations of Apothecary's Latin. I like your hint of making interest for the reversion of the collector's place for Mr. Lismahago, who is much pleased with the scheme, and presents you with his compliments and best thanks for thinking so kindly of his concerns. The man seems to mend upon further acquaintance, 
that harsh reserve which formed a disagreeable husk about his character begins to peel off in the course of our communication. I have great hopes that he and Tabby will be as happily paired as any two draught animals in the kingdom, and I make no doubt but that he will prove a valuable acquisition to our little society in the article of conversation by the fireside in winter. Your objection to my passing this season of the year at such a distance from home would have more weight if I did not find myself perfectly at my ease where I am, and my health so much improved that I am disposed to bid defiance to gout and rheumatism. I begin to think I have put myself on the superannuated list too soon, and absurdly sought for health in the retreats of laziness. I am persuaded that all valetudinarians are too sedentary, too regular, and too cautious. We should sometimes increase the motion of the machine to unclog the wheels of life, and now and then take a plunge amidst the waves of excess in order to case-harden the constitution. I have even found a change of company as necessary as a change of air to promote a vigorous circulation of the spirits, which is the very essence and criterion of good health. Since my last I have been performing the duties of friendship that required a great deal of exercise, from which I hope to derive some benefit. Understanding by the greatest accident in the world that Mr. Baynard's wife was dangerously ill of a pleuritic fever, I borrowed Dennison's post-chaise and went across the country to his habitation, attended only by Lloyd, quondam clinker, on horseback. As the distance is not above thirty miles, I arrived about four in the afternoon, and meeting the physician at the door was informed that his patient had just expired. I was instantly seized with a violent emotion, but it was not grief. The family being in confusion, I ran upstairs into the chamber, where indeed they were all assembled. The aunt stood wringing her hands in a kind of stupefaction of sorrow, but my friend acted all the extravagancies of affliction. He held the body in his arms and poured forth such a lamentation that one would have thought he had lost the most amiable consort and valuable companion upon earth. Affection may certainly exist independent of esteem. Nay, the same object may be lovely in one respect and detestable in another. The mind has a surprising faculty of accommodating, and even attaching itself in such a manner, by dint of use, to things that are in their own nature disagreeable, and even pernicious, that it cannot bear to be delivered from them without reluctance and regret. Baynard was so absorbed in his delirium that he did not perceive me when I entered, and desired one of the women to conduct the aunt into her own chamber. At the same time I begged the tutor to withdraw the boy, who stood gaping in a corner, very little affected with the distress of the scene. These steps being taken, I waited till the first violence of my friend's transport was abated, then disengaged him gently from the melancholy object, and led him by the hand into another apartment, though he struggled so hard that I was obliged to have recourse to the assistance of his valet de chambre. In a few minutes, however, he recollected himself, and folding me in his arms, "'This,' cried he, "'is a friendly office indeed. I know not how you come hither, but I think heaven sent you to prevent my going distracted. Oh, Matthew, I have lost my dear Harriet, my poor gentle tender creature, that loved me with such warmth and purity of affection, my constant companion of twenty years. She's gone. She's gone for ever. Heaven and earth, where is she? Death shall not part us.' So saying, he started up, and could hardly be withheld from returning to the scene we had quitted. You will perceive it would have been very absurd for me to argue with a man that talked so madly. On all such occasions the first torrent of passion must be allowed to subside gradually. I endeavoured to beguile his attention by starting little hints and insinuating other objects of discourse imperceptibly, and being exceedingly pleased in my own mind at this event, I exerted myself with such an extraordinary flow of spirits as was attended with success. In a few hours he was calm enough to hear reason, and even to own that heaven could not have interposed more effectually to rescue him from disgrace and ruin. That he might not, however, relapse into weaknesses for want of company, I passed the night in his chamber, in a little tent-bed brought thither on purpose. And well it was, I took this precaution, for he started up in bed several times, and would have played the fool if I had not been present. Next day he was in a condition to talk of business, invested me with full authority over his household, which I began to exercise without loss of time, though not before he knew and approved of the scheme I had projected for his advantage. He would have quitted the house immediately, but this retreat I opposed. 
far from encouraging a temporary disgust which might degenerate into an habitual aversion i resolved if possible to attach him more than ever to his household gods i gave directions for the funeral to be as private as was consistent with decency i wrote to london that an inventory and estimate might be made of the furniture and effects in his town house and gave notice to the landlord that mr baynard should quit the premises at lady day i set a person at work to take account of everything in the country house including horses carriages and harness I settled the young gentleman at a boarding-school, kept by a clergyman in the neighbourhood, and thither he went without reluctance as soon as he knew that he was to be troubled no more with his tutor, whom we dismissed. The aunt continued very sullen, and never appeared at table, though Mr. Baynard paid his respects to her every day in her own chamber. There also she held conferences with the waiting-women and other servants of the family, but the moment her niece was interred she went away in a post-chaise prepared for that purpose— she did not leave the house, however, without giving Mr. Baynard to understand that the wardrobe of her niece was the perquisite of her woman. Accordingly, that worthless drab received all the clothes, laces, and linen of her deceased mistress, to the value of five hundred pounds, at a moderate computation. The next step I took was to disband that legion of supernumerary domestics who had preyed so long upon the vitals of my friend. A parcel of idle drones, so intolerably insolent, that they even treated their own master with the most contemptuous neglect. They had been generally hired by his wife, according to the recommendation of her woman, and these were the only patrons to whom they paid the least deference. I had, therefore, uncommon satisfaction in clearing the house of these vermin. The woman of the deceased and a chambermaid, a valet de chambre, a butler, a French cook, a master gardener, two footmen and a coachman, I paid off, and turned out of the house immediately, paying to each a month's wages in lieu of warning. Those whom I retained consisted of the female cook, who had been assistant to the Frenchman, a housemaid, an old lackey, a postillion, and undergardener. Thus I removed at once a huge mountain of expense and care from the shoulders of my friend, who could hardly believe the evidence of his own senses, when he found himself so suddenly and so effectually relieved." His heart, however, was still subject to vibrations of tenderness, which returned at certain intervals, extorting sighs and tears, and exclamations of grief and impatience. But these fits grew every day less violent and less frequent, till at length his reason obtained a complete victory over the infirmities of his nature. Upon an accurate enquiry into the state of his affairs, I find his debts amount to twenty thousand pounds, for eighteen thousand pounds of which sum his estate is mortgaged and as he pays five per cent interest and some of his farms are unoccupied he does not receive above two hundred pounds a year clear from his lands over and above the interest of his wife's fortune which produced eight hundred pounds annually for lightening this heavy burthen i devised the following expedient his wife's jewels together with his superfluous plate and furniture in both houses his horses and carriages which are already advertised to be sold by auction will, according to the estimate, produce two thousand five hundred pounds in ready money, with which the debt will be immediately reduced to eighteen thousand pounds. I have undertaken to find him ten thousand pounds at four per cent, by which means he will save one hundred a year in the article of interest, and perhaps we shall be able to borrow the other eight thousand on the same terms. According to his own scheme of a country life, he says he can live comfortably for three hundred pounds a year, but, as he has a son to educate, we will allow him five hundred. Then there will be an accumulating fund of seven hundred a year, principal and interest, to pay off the encumbrance. And, I think, we may modestly add three hundred on the presumption of new leasing and improving the vacant farms, so that in a couple of years I suppose there will be above a thousand a year appropriated to liquidate a debt of sixteen thousand. We forthwith began to class and set apart the articles designed for sale under the direction of an upholder from London, and that nobody in the house might be idle, commenced our reformation without doors as well as within. With Baynard's good leave, I ordered the gardener to turn the rivulet into its old channel, to refresh the fainting naiads, who had so long languished among mouldering roots, withered leaves, and dry pebbles. The shrubbery is condemned to extirpation, and the pleasure-ground will be restored to its original use of cornfield and pasture. Orders are given for rebuilding the walls of the garden at the back of the house, and for planting clumps of firs intermingled with beech and chestnut at the east end which is now quite exposed to the surly blasts that come from that quarter all these works being actually begun 
and the house and auction left to the care and management of a reputable attorney, I brought Baynard along with me in the chaise, and made him acquainted with Dennison, whose goodness of heart would not fail to engage his esteem and affection. He is indeed charmed with our society in general, and declares that he never saw the theory of true pleasure reduced to practice before. I really believe it would not be an easy task to find such a number of individuals assembled under one roof more happy than we are at present. I must tell you, however, in confidence, I suspect Tabby of Tergiversation. I have been so long accustomed to that original that I know all the caprices of her heart, and can often perceive her designs while they are yet in embryo. She attached herself to Lismahago for no other reason but that she despaired of making a more agreeable conquest. At present, if I am not much mistaken in my observation, she would gladly convert the widowhood of Baynard to her own advantage. Since he arrived, she has behaved very coldly to the captain, and strove to fasten on the other's heart with the hooks of overstrained civility. These must be the instinctive efforts of her constitution rather than the effects of any deliberate design, for matters are carried to such a length with the lieutenant that she could not retract with any regard to conscience or reputation. Besides, she will meet with nothing but indifference or aversion on the side of Baynard, who has too much sense to think of such a partner at any time, and too much delicacy to admit a thought of any such connection at the present juncture. Meanwhile, I have prevailed upon her to let him have four thousand pounds at four per cent towards paying off his mortgage. Young Dennison has agreed that Liddy's fortune shall be appropriated to the same purpose on the same terms. His father will sell out three thousand pounds stock for his accommodation. Farmer Bland has, at the desire of Wilson, undertaken for two thousand, and I must make an effort to advance what further will be required to take my friend out of the hands of the Philistines. He is so pleased with the improvements made on his estate, which is all cultivated like a garden, that he has entered himself as a pupil in farming to Mr. Dennison, and resolved to attach himself wholly to the practice of husbandry. Everything is now prepared for our double wedding. The marriage articles for both couples are drawn and executed, and the ceremony only waits until the parties shall have been resident in the parish the term prescribed by law. Young Dennison betrays some symptoms of impatience but Lismahago bears this necessary delay with the temper of a philosopher. You must know, the captain does not stand altogether on the foundation of personal merit. Besides his half-pay, amounting to two and forty pounds a year, this indefatigable economist has amassed eight hundred pounds, which he has secured in the funds. This sum arises partly from his pays running up while he remained among the Indians, partly from what he received as a consideration for the difference between his full appointment and the half-pay to which he is now restricted, and partly from the profits of a little traffic he drove in peltry during his sackhamship among the Miamis. Lydia's fears and perplexities have been much assuaged by the company of one Miss Willis, who had been her intimate companion at the boarding-school. Her parents had been earnestly solicited to allow her making this friendly visit on such an extraordinary occasion, and two days ago she arrived with her mother, who did not choose that she should come without a proper governante. The young lady is very sprightly, handsome, and agreeable, and the mother a mighty good sort of a woman, so that their coming adds considerably to our enjoyment. But we shall have a third couple yoked in the matrimonial chain. Mr. Clinker Lloyd has made humble remonstrance through the canal of my nephew, setting forth the sincere love and affection mutually subsisting between him and Mrs. Winifred Jenkins, and praying my consent to their coming together for life. I would have wished that Mr. Clinker had kept out of this scrape, but as the nymph's happiness is at stake, and she has already some fits in the way of despondence, I, in order to prevent any tragical catastrophe, have given him leave to play the fool in imitation of his betters, and I suppose we shall in time have a whole litter of his progeny at Brambleton Hall. The fellow is stout and lusty, very sober and conscientious, and the wench seems to be as great an enthusiast in love as in religion. I wish you would think of employing him some other way, that the parish may not be overstocked. You know he has been bred a farrier, consequently belongs to the faculty, and as he is very docile, I make no doubt, but with your good instruction, he may be, in a little time, qualified to act as a Welch apothecary. Tabby, who never did a favour with a good grace, has consented, with great reluctance, to this match. Perhaps it hurts her pride, as she now considers Clinker in the light of a relation, but I believe her objections are of a more selfish nature. 
she declares she cannot think of retaining the wife of Matthew Lloyd in the character of a servant, and she foresees that on such an occasion the woman will expect some gratification for her past services. As for Clinker, exclusive of other considerations, he is so trusty, brave, affectionate, and alert, and I owe him such personal obligations, that he merits more than all the indulgence that can possibly be shown him by yours, Matt Bramble, October 26. End of section 81section eighty two of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by martin geeson the expedition of humphrey clinker by tobias smollett section eighty two To Sir Watkin Phillips, Baronet, at Oxford. Dear Knight, the fatal knots are now tied, the comedy is near a close, and the curtain is ready to drop. But the latter scenes of this act I shall recapitulate in order. About a fortnight ago, my uncle made an excursion across the country and brought hither a particular friend, one Mr. Baynard, who has just lost his wife, and was for some time disconsolate, though by all accounts he had much more cause for joy than for sorrow at this event. His countenance, however, clears up apace, and he appears to be a person of rare accomplishments but we have received another still more agreeable reinforcement to our company by the arrival of miss willis from gloucester she was liddy's bosom friend at the boarding-school and being earnestly solicited to assist at the nuptials her mother was so obliging as to grant my sister's request and even to come with her in person liddy accompanied by george dennison and me gave them the meeting half-way, and next day conducted them hither in safety. Miss Willis is a charming girl, and in point of disposition an agreeable contrast to my sister, who is rather too grave and sentimental for my turn of mind. The other is gay, frank, a little giddy, and always good-humoured. She has, moreover, a genteel fortune is well born and remarkably handsome ah phillips if these qualities were permanent if her humour would never change nor her beauties decay what efforts would i not make but these are idle reflections my destiny must one day be fulfilled at present we pass the time as agreeably as we can we have got up several farces which afforded unspeakable entertainment by the effects they produce among the country people who are admitted to all our exhibitions two nights ago jack wilson acquired great applause in harlequin skeleton and lismahago surprised us all in the character of pierrot his long lank sides and strong marked features were all peculiarly adapted to his part. He appeared with a ludicrous stare, from which he had discharged all meaning. He adopted the impressions of fear and amazement, so naturally that many of the audience were infected by his looks. But when the skeleton held him in chase, his horror became most divertingly picturesque, and seemed to endow him with such preternatural agility as confounded all the spectators it was a lively representation of death in pursuit of consumption and had such an effect upon the commonalty that some of them shrieked aloud and others ran out of the hall in the utmost consternation this is not the only instance in which the lieutenant has lately excited our wonder his temper 
which had been soured and shrivelled by disappointment and chagrin is now swelled out and smoothed like a raisin in plum porridge from being reserved and punctilious he has become easy and obliging he cracks jokes laughs and banters with the most facetious familiarity and in a word enters into all our schemes of merriment and pastime the other day his baggage arrived in the wagon from london contained in two large trunks and a long deal box not unlike a coffin the trunks were filled with his wardrobe which he displayed for the entertainment of the company and he freely owned that it consisted chiefly of the opima spolia taken in battle what he selected for his wedding suit was a tarnished white cloth faced with blue velvet embroidered with silver but he valued himself most upon a tie periwig in which he had made his first appearance as a lawyer above thirty years ago this machine has been in buckle ever since and now all the servants in the family were employed to frizz it out for the occasion which was yesterday celebrated at the parish church george dennison and his bride were distinguished by nothing extraordinary in their apparel his eyes lightened with eagerness and joy and she trembled with coyness and confusion my uncle gave her away and her friend Willis supported her during the ceremony. But my aunt and her paramour took the pas, and formed indeed such a pair of originals as I believe all England could not parallel. She was dressed in the style of 1739, and the day being cold, put on a mantle of green velvet laced with gold. But this was taken off by the bridegroom, who threw over her shoulders a fur cloak of American sables, valued at fourscore guineas, a present equally agreeable and unexpected. Thus accoutred, she was led up to the altar by Mr. Dennison, who did the office of her father. Liz Mahago advanced in the military step with his French coat reaching no farther than the middle of his thigh, his campaign wig that surpasses all description, and a languishing leer upon his countenance, in which there seemed to be something arch and ironical. The ring which she put upon her finger he had concealed till the moment it was used. He now produced it with an air of self-complacency. It was a curious antique, set with rose diamonds. He told us afterwards it had been in the family two hundred years, and was a present from his grandmother. These circumstances agreeably flattered the pride of our Aunt Tabitha, which had already found uncommon gratification in the captain's generosity for he had in the morning presented my uncle with a fine bear's skin and a spanish fowling-piece and me with a case of pistols curiously mounted with silver at the same time he gave mistress jenkins an indian purse made of silk grass containing twenty crown pieces you must know this young lady with the assistance of mr lloyd formed the third couple who yesterday sacrificed to hymen i wrote to you in my last that he had recourse to my mediation which i employed successfully with my uncle but mistress tabitha held out till the lovesick jenkins had two fits of the mother then she relented and those two cooing turtles were caged for life our aunt made an effort of generosity in furnishing the bride with her superfluities of clothes and linen, and her example was followed by my sister. Nor did Mr. Bramble and I neglect her on this occasion. It was indeed a day of peace-offering. Mr. Dennison insisted upon Liddy's accepting two banknotes of one hundred pounds each as pocket-money 
and his lady gave her a diamond necklace of double that value there was besides a mutual exchange of tokens among the individuals of the two families thus happily united as george dennison and his partner were judged improper objects of mirth jack wilson had resolved to execute some jokes upon lismahago and after supper began to ply him with bumpers when the ladies had retired but the captain perceiving his drift begged for quarter alleging that the adventure in which he had engaged was a very serious matter and that it would be more the part of a good christian to pray that he might be strengthened than to impede his endeavours to finish the adventure he was spared accordingly and permitted to ascend the nuptial couch with all his senses about him there he and his consort sat in state like saturn and sibylle while the benediction posset was drank and a cake being broken over the head of mrs tabitha lismahago the fragments were distributed among the bystanders according to the custom of the ancient britons on the supposition that every person who ate of this hallowed cake should that night have a vision of the man or woman whom heaven designed should be his or her wedded mate the weight of wilson's waggery fell upon honest humphrey and his spouse who were bedded in an upper room with the usual ceremony of throwing the stocking this being performed and the company withdrawn a sort of caterwauling ensued when jack found means to introduce a real cat shod with walnut shells which galloping across the boards made such a dreadful noise as effectually discomposed our lovers winifred screamed aloud and shrunk under the bedclothes mr lloyd believing that satan was come to buffet him in propria persona laid aside all carnal thoughts and began to pray aloud with great fervency at length the poor animal being more afraid than either leapt into the bed and meowled with the most piteous exclamation lloyd thus informed of the nature of the annoyance rose and set the door wide open so that this troublesome visitant retreated with great expedition then securing himself by means of a double bolt from a second intrusion he was left to enjoy his good fortune without further disturbance if one may judge from the looks of the parties they are all very well satisfied with what has passed george dennison and his wife are too delicate to exhibit any strong marked signs of their mutual satisfaction but their eyes are sufficiently expressive mrs tabitha lismahago is rather fulsome in signifying her approbation of the captain's love while his deportment is the very pink of gallantry he sighs and ogles and languishes at this amiable object he kisses her hand mutters ejaculations of rapture and sings tender airs and no doubt laughs internally at her folly in believing him sincere in order to show how little his vigour was impaired by the fatigues of the preceding day he this morning danced a highland saraband over a naked back-sword and leapt so high that i believe he would make no contemptible figure as a vaulter at sadler's wells mr matthew lloyd when asked how he relished his bargain threw up his eyes crying for what we have received lord make us thankful amen his helpmate giggles and holds her hand before her eyes affecting to be ashamed of having been in bed with a man thus all these widgeons enjoy the novelty of their situation 
but perhaps their notes will be changed when they are better acquainted with the nature of the decoy as mrs willis cannot be persuaded to stay and liddy is engaged by promise to accompany her daughter back to gloucester i fancy there will be a general migration from hence and that most of us will spend the christmas holidays at bath in which case i shall certainly find an opportunity to beat up your quarters by this time i suppose you are sick of alma mater and even ready to execute that scheme of peregrination which was last year concerted between you and your affectionate j melford november eighth end of section eighty two section eighty three of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 83. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Doctor, My niece Liddy is now happily settled for life, and Captain Lismahago has taken Tabby off my hands, so that I have nothing further to do but to comfort my friend Baynard, and provide for my son Lloyd, who is also fairly joined to Mrs. Winifred Jenkins. You are an excellent genius at hints. Dr. Arbuthnot was but a type of Dr. Lewis in that respect. What you observe of the vestry clerk deserves consideration. I make no doubt, but Matthew Lloyd is well enough qualified for the office, but at present you must find room for him in the house." His incorruptible honesty and indefatigable care will be serviceable in superintending the economy of my farm, though I don't mean that he shall interfere with Barnes, of whom I have no cause to complain. I am just returned with Baynard from a second trip to his house, where everything is regulated to his satisfaction. He could not, however, review the apartments without tears and lamentation, so that he is not yet in a condition to be left alone. Therefore I will not part with him till the spring— when he intends to plunge into the avocations of husbandry, which will at once employ and amuse his attention. Charles Dennison has promised to stay with him a fortnight, to set him fairly afloat in his improvements, and Jack Wilson will see him from time to time. Besides, he has a few friends in the country whom his new plan of life will not exclude from his society. In less than a year, I make no doubt but that he will find himself perfectly at ease, both in his mind and body, for the one had dangerously affected the other and I shall enjoy the exquisite pleasure of seeing my friend rescued from misery and contempt. Mrs. Willis, being determined to return with her daughter in a few days to Gloucester, our plan has undergone some alteration. Jerry has persuaded his brother-in-law to carry his wife to Bath, and I believe his parents will accompany him thither. For my part, I have no intention to take that route. It must be something very extraordinary that will induce me to revisit either Bath or London. My sister and her husband— Baynard and I will take leave of them at Gloucester, and make the best of our way to Brambleton Hall, where I desire you will prepare a good chine and turkey for our Christmas dinner. You must also employ your medical skill in defending me from the attacks of the gout, that I may be in good case to receive the rest of our company, who promise to visit us in their return from the bath. As I have laid in a considerable stock of health, it is to be hoped you will not have much trouble with me in the way of physic, but I intend to work you on the side of exercise. I have got an excellent fowling-piece for Mr. Lismahago, who is a keen sportsman, and we shall take the heath in all weathers. That this scheme of life may be prosecuted the more effectually, I intend to renounce all sedentary amusements, particularly that of writing long letters, a resolution which, had I taken it sooner, might have saved you the trouble which you have lately taken in reading the tedious epistles of Matt Bramble, November 20. End of section 83section eighty four of the expedition of humphrey clinker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruth golding the expedition of humphrey clinker by tobias smollett section eighty four 
to Mrs. Gwillim at Brambleton Hall. Good Mrs. Gwillim, heaven for wise porpoises hath ordained that I should change my name and citation in life, so that I am not to be considered any more as manager of my brother's family. But as I cannot surrender up my stewardship till I have settled with you and Williams, I desire you will get your accounts ready for inspection, as we are coming home without further delay. My spouse, the captain, being subject to rheumatics, I beg you will take great care to have the blue chamber, up two pair of stairs, well warmed for his reception. Let the sashes be secured, the crevices stopped, the carpets laid, and the beds well tousled. Mrs. Lloyd, late Jenkins, being married to a relation of the family, cannot remain in the capacity of a servant. Therefore I wish you would cast about for some creditable body to be with me in her room. If she can spin, and is mistress of plain work, so much the better." but she must not expect extravagant wages. Having a family of my own, I must be more ocumenical than ever. No more at present, but rests your loving friend, Tab Lismago, November 20th. End of section 84「Providence hath been pleased to make great halteration in the pasture of our affairs. We were yesterday three kipple chained, by the grace of God, in the holy bands of matter money, and I now subscribe myself Lloyd at your service. All the parish allowed that young Squire Dallison and his bride was a comely pair for to see. As for Madame Lashtonahago, you knows her picularities, her head to be sure was fantastical, and her spouse had wrapped her with a long American furs cloak from the land of the selvages, though they say it is of immense valley. The captain himself had a huge hassock of air, with three tails, and a tum tawdry coat, boddered with sulphur. One said he was a monkey bank, and the old butler swore he was the born image of Tidadal. For my part I says nothing, being as how the captain has done the handsome thing by me. Mr. Lloyd was dressed in a light frog, and check it with gold binding, and though he didn't enter in comparison with great folks of quality, yet he has got as good blood in his veins as arrow private squire in the county, and then his pursing is far from contentable. Your humble servant had on a plain pea-green tabby sack, with my runella cap, rough toupee, and side curls. They said I was the very moral of Lady Rickmanstone, but not so pale." That may well be, for her ladyship is my elder by seven good years and more. Now, Mrs. Mary, our satiety is to separate. Mr. Milfart goes to Bath along with the Dallisons, and the rest of us push home to Wales to pass our Krishmarsh in Brampleton Hall. As our apartments is to be the yellow pepper in the third story, pray carry my things thither. Present my compliments to Mrs. Gwillem, and I hope she and I will live upon descent terms of civility. Being, by God's blessing, removed to a higher sphere, you'll excuse my being familiar with the lower servants of the family, but, as I trust you'll behave respectful, and keep a proper distance, you may always depend upon the good will and protection of yours, W. Lloyd, November 20. End of section 85 End of The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett